um good afternoon everyone welcome back after lunch uh, so this uh, this session is particularly more you know probably of interest would be of interest to you it looks at the intersection of media and other identities it looks at invisibilization uh lack of representation at the same time what lack of representation does what are its consequences how misrepresentation and stereotypes get reproduced in media and so on uh for the f uh, for the second session we have four speakers uh first i would like to uh, introduce professor peetrumal who will be our first speaker peetrumal is professor at the department of communication sn school of arts and communication university of hyderabad his area his areas of interest and specialization include theoretical history of media critical caste studies northeast studies and science technology studies he has written several influential essays on the theme of caste discrimination in higher educational institutions in india he has published in the indian economic and social history uh, review economic and political weekly seminar and has written for newspapers and periodicals in 2018 he co-authored a book titled modern mizoram history culture poetics published by rutledge he is editor of a forthcoming book inhabiting technologies media and performative cultures in india by orient black swan with this i welcome professor tirumal uh, thank you akash and thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh actually uh my presentation is not about invisibilization but basically about hyper visibility of certain communities especially the brahmin community <laughs> and uh, <coughs> uh i've been working on this for some time i've been writing about it so i'll just give you some idea of what has been my uh for want of a better word a philosophical uh a line of inquiry uh what interests me is what brahmins do and it, uh, and it uh in some sense i'm saying that what brahmins think is of lesser consequence for me than what they do because their action seems to have a much more complex more intricate a very uh uh very uh, uh very complex apparatus <coughs> whereas the thinking may not be the uh, may not uh, be uh, similar in terms of its uh, density uh, richness and elaboration in some sense <laughs> uh so i'm privileging ontology which is basically lived practices over epistemology or intellectual thought etc <coughs> in if i were to reduce uh this particular theme that i have uh it's basically uh a how brahmin body thinks rather than how their mind thinks uh, that's a very reductive way of talking about it but to exaggerate what i want to say I, i'm saying that <clears throat> now one of the reasons why i do this is because the practices seems to contain memories that are not particularly available for consciousness and therefore it is important for us to look at the body as a key corporeal technology of the brahmins uh <clears throat> this particular topic uh, i uh, along with my colleagues have written a piece it's yet to be published but uh, basically this grew out of my interest in teaching media history or almost two decades i found the materials on media history uh, to be very impoverished uh, and it was exclusively based on the idea that everything that happened to media happened during or after colonialism the reception of the technology content consumption aesthetics has to be understood within the spatio temporal axis of colonialism or 
vice versa, anti-colonialism, which is nationalism. So I look for theoretical, and uh, bear with me some technical terms which I'm going to use here and there. Uh, so I look for theoretical and methodological tools from outside media history, the conventional media history I'm talking about, which we do in journalism departments, to include materials that take a longitudinal view of media history and spans a very wider swath of history. Uh, I also look at um, the, uh, uh, what do you call, I look for an expansive idea of media to include expressive arts, literary, and performative cultures. The exploratory term that I want to introduce is Indic media. I'm using it loosely, but uh, let me tell you what exactly it is. So from what I've just told you, I'm moving from some kind of a nationalist, colonialist perspective to some kind of a civilizational understanding of what could be media. Uh, one is not competent to do that job, but I'm just, it's just some speculation, okay. I felt that Indic media offers a very different frame of understanding media technological history. To give a brief idea of what may constitute Indic idea, actually a specific strain of the Indic, I will refer to a few examples. Now, Sanskrit was committed to writing much after it created such cultural monuments as Mahabharata, Ramayana, major grammatical and philological works, scriptural and religious literature, including works on law and poetics. Uh, but this is something which communication scholars nor media scholars have done enough work on. It took almost seven to eight centuries for Sanskrit to commit to writing. It produced all these cultural monuments, but it was committed to writing much, much later. Similarly, the millennial Indian languages, I don't want to use the term vernacular, took to writing quite late. Um, if you look at the manuscript culture that comes in the medieval period, you'll find in terms of aesthetics, Indian languages, like Islamic languages, rarely invested themselves in the art of calligraphy. Calligraphy is such an important uh, advancement in uh, writing technology. The uh, Muslim world did not take up typing, uh, typography because their calligraphy is much more advanced. It took some, uh, <coughs> again, the technology of print was inordinately delayed. The Chinese and Tibetans bought woodblock printing to India and many of the Sanskrit literati knew about it as early as 12th or 13th century. The first printing mission reached Goa in 1556, but printing was normalized only in the mid 19th century. In fact, uh, uh, Chris Bailey, the historian, would tell you that writing itself was uh, used for governance from the late 19th century. Historically, literate society, you know, its writing is normalized very late. <clears throat> if you look at the consumption pattern, sorry, Patashalas from the late 18th to 19th century refused to use printed books as they considered the ink that was used for print as pollutant material. Now, these are some illustrations to give you some ideas of what could be an Indic history, you know, in terms of depth, in terms of uh, the, uh, <coughs> the media that we are talking about, writing, print. It could also be paper, it could be so many other technologies uh, uh, connected to print, uh, manuscript culture as well as print culture. The second question which I want to ask is, what is the relationship between elite cultural practices, Brahmanical practices, and technological affordances? Now, if you look to literature uh, from uh, disciplinary domains like uh, science technology studies and anthropology studies, they have made it clear that just like human beings require a melu to grow and become, technologies also require a melu to become, to grow. <laughs> The theory of co-evolution posits that human beings should contribute to the melu of technology and technology should contribute to an environment that is enabling for human beings. So in some sense, I'm asking how elite practices have shaped. In that sense, I'll be examining how historically Brahmanic cultural practices allowed for technology to grow or become. 
In the same breath, I would like to suggest, in an exploratory manner, how Brahmins have tried to retain, while doing this, uh, some kind of cultural hegemony across different historical epochs by interpreting, negotiating, and setting the terms of reference for historical rationalities. Historical rationalities could be technology, political craft, um, uh, medicine, I mean, whatever we got during the British or even earlier with Islam, newer technologies came to India, right? Now, you find that whenever they have interacted with historical rationalities, they always try to augment tradition rather than facilitate technological and historical possibilities. Uh, there are two sorts of assertion that you find again in literature about cultural practices and shaping of technology. One is that technology frees history from tradition, which is a very Walter Benjamin kind of a proposition. Now let me give you an example from uh, the work of Venkata Chalapati, who wrote on coffee. Now what Venkata Chalapati is saying on the history of coffee consumption in, uh, in, in, uh, by the Tamil Brahmins is, the, the steel tumbler, there is a rim which comes. Uh, the, because the, uh, the tumbler is not supposed to touch the lip. There's a, there's a way that you, so now if I have to extend this technology, actually this is in some sense also reminds one of the chumbur, uh, the brass pot uh, of a similar kind of a design. And the chumba, in, in some sense, uh, also is about a certain acharam, a certain kind of tradition. So the modern steel tumbler, in some sense, is connected to the chumba, and the chumba is connected to a certain kind of tradition. So there is a way that the steel tumbler does not disburden itself from tradition. I mean, that if, if you want one of the examples, I don't know how uh, a sufficient that exam, I mean, how, uh, 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 how it validates uh, this uh, particular assertion fully, but that could be one of the examples. Alternatively, technology can restore tradition and contain the generation of history. See, technology can produce history, right? To contain the generation of history by unburdening itself from tradition. So the, well, the assertion that I'm going to make here is Brahmanical practices as expressions of Brahmanical comportment across epochs have successfully denied technology its power to generate and valorize history or contingency. There's a way technology has been mediated by the Brahmin body in, in a, uh, that it does not produce uh, opportunities for the generation of history or contingency. That is, it does not disburden itself. <coughs> Comportment makes one understand an unfamiliar environment by providing a framework of meaning. Suppose you, a new technology comes, uh, so you're not aware of how community should react to this new, new technology. So how, in that kind of an unfamiliar situation, we still know that communities engage with that, right? There's a framework of meaning to understand an unfamiliar environment. So that is comportment. Comportment is a non-discursive aspect, not the discursive aspect. It's some kind of a pre-theoretical understanding. The body understands, the body grasps it, right? Now, <coughs> the invoking, uh, I'm sorry, Brahmanical comportment as a key corporeal technology disallows the unruliness of con contingency by invoking an erratic Indian past. Now, this is a term that I want to play with for some time, the erratic India, Indian past, a, by which I mean a historic tradition that allows the experience of a deep continuity. In, in what I'm trying to suggest is, the Brahmin seems to experience uh, or mobilize a time which no other community can experience. It, it experiences a very deep historic continuity that none of other communities experience. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that deep continuity has, in some sense, is suffused with aura. The Brahmin community may be considered a historically continuous community like no other community in the world. The invoking of the oratic past with the Brahmanic comportment 
facilitates the persistent capacities of Brahmins to remain at the top of the ontological order. <laughs> Brahmin cultural practices are venerated, valued, and privileged, and they form what can be called as cultural constants across every historical epoch. For those of you who know M. N. Srinivas's idea of what is Sanskritization, Sanskritization is lower caste trying to imitate the upper caste, right? Now, that is a kind of a cultural constraint that is produced in every historical epoch. You may find it during the Mughals, you may find it during the Bhakti movement, you may find it. So the, the Brahmins are throwing up a framework for the lower caste as well. But what do they do themselves? <laughs> now, those who, uh, who are familiar with scholars who worked on nationalism, like uh, Sudipta Kaviraj and Partha Chatterjee, they will, they, uh, you will notice they allude to a temporality that is not modern. That is, the nationalists, when they're embracing the modern nation, modern nation state, they're also embracing a certain kind of a past. And uh, this is alluded to, for instance, Siddhipta Kaviraj says, remarks that the nationalists invoked antiquity, he calls it antiquity, to, in order to inhabit the radical present. The radical, it's, it's a completely change, the colonial, I mean, the British have come, the white men has come and changed our present, historical present, very radically. And, but somehow, we invent an antiquity, and we try to give some kind of a validity to our past. Now, <coughs> for me, this antiquity symbolically refers to the erratic past. Similarly, when Partha Chatterjee is making, makes the distinction between the inner domain and the outer domain, Partha Chatterjee is another person who worked on nationalism. He calls the inner domain as something that is private, spiritual. Uh, women are part of that inner domain. The public domain is the political craft, science, technology, everything is in the outer domain. When he's making that kind of a distinction, he seems to allude to two different kinds of temporality. Now, one... <coughs> The temporality that he attributes to the inner domain seems to be this Brahmanic, erratic past. I mean, that it is, it, he never says that, but it looks as if he's alluding to that, right? He's suggesting something like that. In a certain manner of thinking, and uh, it's, it's a guesswork, uh, speculative, Brahmins are both historical and trans-historical entities and beings. You know, uh, some time back, uh, MSS Pandey, in one of his articles, he spoke about one step out of modernity. Now, this one step I'm trying to elaborate in some sense. What is this one step out of modernity? Uh, now, there are two other sources for understanding Brahmanical comportment. Uh, as an enabling inheritance and allow Brahmins to experience a historic tradition that is suffused with this aura. M. N. Srinivas, while making a distinction between Sanskritization and Brahminization, suggests that when lower caste imitate the upper caste, these communities invoke only historical and epochal meanings, and therefore the temporality is inauthentic. He does not say this, but it looks as if he's suggesting that this Sanskrit, the, the temporality that's associated with the lower caste imitating the upper caste, that temporality is inauthentic. Whereas he suggests that upper caste have access to performing Vedic rituals, you know, one is the upper caste, the, the, they, see, they seem to be connected to a deep historical con, uh, co uh, continuity, which is again a deep time that is suffused with aura. Uh, I also give uh, another source for understanding this deep historical continuity, and uh, I am I am not able to figure out uh, who is this Indologist, but this is what he said. He said Brahmins are like flying fish, like they are inside the water and they are outside the water. They can skip the history. They can get out of history whenever they want to, and you know come back. <coughs> In some sense. The erratic past as a distance generating power. Brahmanic comportment resignifies historical, contingent, and epochal context with an erratic meaning and value dispositions. So, what is the power? The power is 
that they can produce a, a distance. That is, the, that is what is aura. Aura is about producing distance, right? So the Brahmanic power to create distance is that tension with technology's power to create nearness. Technology want to create nearness. That's what uh, Walter Benjamin would say. But the Brahmins want to create distance. And this is, there is an interesting tension. Uh, I'll give you three examples and then I'll stop with this. Uh, in his earlier, earlier work on religion among Kurdis, I'm using a field note of M.N. Srinivas and what he says about the field is a very interesting thing. Um, so this is uh, about his work among the Kurgis, religion among Kurgis. And this, uh, uh, within quote, he says, things associated with high caste, their houses, clothes, customs, manners, and ritual tend to become symbols of superior status. So the same radio can be in upper caste house and the same radio can be in a lower caste house. But he says, things acquire superior status when it is the upper caste. This philosophically precocious statement, something of a shared understanding and reality of caste society, seems to be born out of a lived experience as much as an acute field experience. You know, M.N. Srinivas was one of the first uh, uh, sociologists who broke away from Indology. He said, don't read text, we'll go to the field and find out what's happening. And here is what he's uh, doing. <clears throat> Perhaps in this particular case, field observation does not remove the original ground of experience and scientific analysis refuses to contain the vitality that leads to producing and embellishing brute social facts. So he produces a rich description, which is of his lived experience, as much as it's of his professional, as a professional sociologist would do it. In other words, we can infer the process of entanglement in the way the field is described in terms of both pre-discursive and discursive forms of intelligibility. Very consciously you understand something and you have a very, what do you call, an embodied understanding of something, right? So there is an entanglement. <laughs> the second uh, illustration that I want to give, so the two things that I'm doing here, what I'm saying is you can be a professional, but your lived experience can shape that profession. And <clears throat> the second one is a contemporary Kannada historical novel, Swapna Saraswate, uh, written by uh, uh, Gopala Krishna Pai in 2017, uh, traces the reception of the first printing machine in uh, Portuguese Goa. So he's talking about seven generations of Saraswat Brahmins who, uh, you know, from the, you know, the Portuguese are very uh, uh, persecutory lot. They, uh, they persecuted, especially the Brahmins. So the Saraswat Brahmin community took uh, when this new printing machine arrives in Goa, and there is a scene in the chapter in the, in the book, the Saraswat community took exception and imposed a ban on the printing machine. More importantly, while evaluating the new cultural technology and the potential for the disruption of religious and social order, because they thought anything could be, you know, produced in this printing press, religious things could be produced, so they had some problem with that. The novel provides, apart from this, the novel provides an interesting description of the muscular strength needed for the use of the stylus and the complex corporeal aesthetics required to participate as copies in a scriptorium. This is happening in uh, Mata, Kavala, Kavali Mata in somewhere in South Goa. And uh, these people who, are, who impose a ban of people who are copists in a Mata, I mean, they, they talk to themselves. Now, such an emphasis speaks of the anxiety attendant on the physiological, psychological, and technological discontinuity anticipated due to changes in technology. Uh, uh, you know, uh, now this kind of a reading is not available in social sciences. In literature provides, uh, the literature as a genre is much more expressive about your comportment and your embodiment than uh, uh, professional social sciences. The motor intentionality alongside the rational discussion of the loss of cultural power that the mission may cause forms the constitutive response of the Brahmanic comportment. Uh, in a certain liberative sense, the idealities that govern the practice of writing are less to take care, Foucault would say writing initially with the Greeks was to take care of oneself. 
uh, was less to take care of oneself in time than to take care of oneself beyond that time. Brahmanic comportment realizes that self is not given, but has to be made from something that already exists, and that which pre-exists is recognized as valuable and spiritually edifying. This bodily being strives for an identity that is not bereft of integrity, and it participates and puts forward a case for generative constancy in this particular historical and technological juncture. I'm talking about when the, when, the, when the new printing press comes in Goa. Constancy provides a proper orientation to the changing present and an undesirable feature. future. Uh, in this case, constancy is yet to crystallize and the comportment's ability to negotiate the power of technology to stage con con contingency seems inadequate. The Brahmin cannot take over the power of technology because it's, uh, they, uh, the Portuguese are, have the state, they have money, they have everything. So the Brahmin comportment cannot provide an alternative. So it is the incipient state. <laughs> The invoking of a non-contingent cause and the withdrawal from technology-induced life possibilities are born out of the fear of democratizing the return word. Also, it diminishes the perceived power of the Brahmin to give sense and value to words, texts, or images. <coughs> so uh, the, the difference between rulers and the Brahmin classes, that could be historical events, but those historical events receive value, receive a certain way of understanding uh, uh, that is the job of the Brahmin. I mean, it is, he may not actually participate in the event, but they, are, they give certificates for those events, <coughs> right? Now, cultural, the last one, cultural studies scholarship, and this is about the Hindu newspaper. Uh, <coughs> this is also from uh, a work of Pandian. Uh, he cites this work. Uh, uh, he, he says that when the Justice Party is inaugurated in 1917, uh, the Hindu newspaper took a view that they will not report it. And uh, they said, uh, we do not wish to open a correspondence column on the subject as it cannot but lead to acrimonious controversy. I'm not interested in this statement, but I would like to say how the idea of Brahmin comportment can actually open up cultural studies to view this event outside the colonial context. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we would like to believe that the primary assumption of Indian cultural studies scholarship is to seek and understand historical, and this is what I would like to emphasize, is to seek and understand historical intentionality within the space of inscribed history. It rarely works with the supposition that there may be historically indeterminate structures of existence and traditional modes of being that crisscross the historically constituted every day. So our practices, while we are in a particular historical epoch, may belong to a practices which are much older. <coughs> uh, now, the, did these traditional structures of existence interrupt, appropriate, and disappropriate the historically constituted everyday existence of modern institutions like newspaper organizations in colonial India? While I'm in agreement with Pandian, but I think you need to also have a much uh, a deeper historical uh, examination. <clears throat> it is possible to account, uh, Pandian is basically saying that there is a certain way that there's a conscious decision made. But I'm trying to argue, uh, it is possible to account for the directedness of the conscious decision as arising from a sort of non-deliberate spontaneous form of Brahmanic awareness or comportment, and this is rarely the subject of cultural study scholarship. Uh, I uh, conclude, Com comportment is suggestive of a range of orientations or directedness that the cultural elite has displayed towards technologies in general and media technologies in particular. Its direction is at once disruptive, creative, and deeply restorative. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dirumal. Uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, one thing I would like to reflect is that, you know, when we talk about caste, this always, it's almost like we are talking about Dalits or OBCs or 
tribals or you know it's it's like this assumption and when professor trimal started talking about brahmin body you know i i thought you know that's there's something um, you know not uh, you know usual in these conversations uh, for the next talk we have braj ranjan mani who i would like to introduce um, uh, braj ranjan mani is the author of debrahmanizing history dominance and resistance in indian society first published in 2005 second revised edition 2015 and knowledge and power a discourse for transformation debrahmanizing history has undergone 10 reprints has been translated into four indian languages and has become part of social science curriculum in several indian and overseas universities his other publications include resurgent buddhism ambedkar's predecessors in modern india a forgotten liberator the life and struggle of savitri bai phule bhakti radicalism Mani is a maverick non-institutional scholar and he researches and writes on a range of socio-cultural issues concerning India's marginalized majority. Formerly he was a journalist with the Times of India, a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies Shimla and had worked for a while as Dr. Ambedkar chair professor at NIS WSS Bhuvaneshwar before he decided to work independently. Uh, Brajranjan Mani thanks for the very kind introduction uh, would like to thank asian college of journalism and its distinguished faculty for inviting me to participate in this important colloquium uh, i'm speaking on caste in the media and academia and i would try to highlight some aspects and issues related to the subject in the larger and rather simpler uh, in larger perspective and in simpler terms <clears throat> as india faces increasing inequalities of income education and health caste has returned to the center stage of public sphere as the raging debate on the caste census shows caste comes back is the latest cover story of the front line and many of you must have seen it but caste had not gone anywhere in the first place caste votes and still remains the overwhelming factor in social life and the most important regulator of life chances despite all the changes the power of caste in restricting the choices and agencies available to the vast majority of lowered castes remains a great deal intact it's not so mysterious disappearance from the political theater was staged by its secret lovers who had no intention of rendering it lifeless however suffering from the same mindset the media pundits and academics keep writing obituaries of caste mn srinivas the doyen of indian sociology and renowned for his work on uh, social change in modern india and caste and about which uh, we heard a devastating penetrating uh, account actually an insight into his entire work in a very uh, short but uh, a, uh, a revealing uh, account <coughs> did it in the 1990s he wrote uh, 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 the famous essay uh, the obituary is obituary of the caste system uh <clears throat> uh in uh, i think it was published in the epw <clears throat> uh more recently uh we have read many media and uh, uh analysts and commentators gushing over the what they term the irrelevance of caste and the defeat of caste politics in the wake of ascendant fundamentalist politics that stresses hindu unity and hides caste divides but the festering caste trumps its deniers every time mockingly reminding them 
that their report of its lifelessness is much exaggerated. One does not have to be an Ambedkar to see that caste blind game is played to stop public debate on the role of caste in society. Such concealment of caste is pathological as those who dominate the intellectual domain have a vested interest in not recognizing the social reality. Taking insight from Laka, the psychologist who is known as the French Freud, I would argue that the academic and popular knowledge about caste in India is imbued with paranoia and such paranoiac knowledge manifests itself as the desire not to know the things as they are. Ironically, those elites also see themselves as proponents of democracy, which produces, I think, a peculiar condition of bad faith. Though a complex concept, the essence of bad faith is that it involves doing something that one knows to be wrong. Forever living and acting in bad faith and its consequences can paralyze one's conscience. In other words, being cast blind in a caste society amounts to supporting the institutionalized discrimination as the postures of bad faith and the resultant blindness of insight merge together to provide the mental oxygen for reproduction of social inequalities in contemporary India. Such mindset prompts our intelli intelligentsia to preach that what really matters is growth, not inequality, because unless the country generates enough wealth, nothing can be distributed among the have-nots. Such prioritizing of charity over social change is dangerous because unchecked inequality makes growth itself unsustainable as it keeps a large number of people unhealthy and uneducated and thus thwarting their potential to contribute to national development. Moreover, keeping the people abjectly dependent on doles debases fundamentally debases our politics and democracy. Democratic politics revolves around who gets what, how, and when, and not on charity from above. However, our opinion makers somehow never see that towing only economic model of development in a vastly unequal society exacerbates inequalities because economic development is value free. And this is a crucial difference between economic development and social development. Social development, on the other hand, is value-driven. <clears throat> uh, it's value-driven uh, because, uh, uh, because it aligns for a politics uh, that makes polity and economy uh, opt for policies uh, uh, which bring uh, positive social change. That is why when we talk of development, we should ask first who are at the center of change and what are their values and reasons. For development doesn't bring progress in a similar way to everyone. Many are left behind and even turned into victims of development. This becomes clear from the fact that the bottom half of our population still live under severely disabling condition bereft of basic necessities. The worst, the worst sufferers are children from traditionally subjugated castes. Almost half of them remain malnourished and stunted even today. They are now going to school, but this schooling doesn't amount to much as majority of them are not able to acquire even basic skills like reading, writing, and simple arithmetic as the annual status of education reports of recent years point out. The good for nothing schooling gives the children zero skills and robs their life chances and choices. The Indian state 
has the second largest standing army in the world. It can deliver a nuclear bomb and launch satellites, but cannot give quality education to its children. They remain trapped <clears throat> in un underfunded, brutal, and ineffective state schools, which are worst in the world, especially in the northern Hindi belt. In other words, a schooling revolution, which is the backbone of any social change, has not yet taken place in India. This is not an accident, but a choice made by the ruling elite and it reflects their values. Portels explains the fact that while churning out millions of children without life-enhancing skills, India also produces 100,000 students a year in global top 10 percent, and 600,000 young Indians go abroad every year for higher education. And it is no brainer than those students who are excelling and competing with the best in the world are mostly from privileged castes and the mass of youngsters who are kept barely literate are mostly from Dalit Adivasi and other backward classes. This was the point made by Myron Weiner, the social scientist, in his important book, The Child and the State in India, with revealing comparisons with the similarly placed countries which marched ahead because they brought in educational turnaround, Weiner shows that India's pol policies towards children emanate from a discriminatory culture rather than from economic conditions. Identifying the values that elsewhere led educators, socio-religious leaders, and bureaucrats to make education effective enough for social change, Weiner explains that similar groups in India fear real education because of its potential to subvert hierarchical social order. Many things have changed since Weiner wrote that book in 1991, but its emphasis on a discriminatory culture holding, in, uh, holding back India's progress still holds. Thus, contrary to the elitist refrain that the new economy has made caste irrelevant, the ground surveys and statistics show the reproduction of caste inequalities. Existing data on caste occupation and standard of living of caste groups affirm the persistence of caste discrimination. Data points towards continuation of traditional hierarchies rather than towards their dissolution, with upper caste at the top, Dalit Adivasis at the bottom, and OBCs somewhere in between. This is true not just for rural and informal sectors, but also for formal urban sector markets that show a deep awareness of caste, class, gender, and religion-based cleavages. Revealing these facts, two out outstanding books on the subject, uh, Blocked by Caste, edited by Thorat and Newman, and uh, Ashwini Deshpande's The Grammar of Caste, stress that discrimination is very much a modern sector phenomenon perpetuated in the present. The seeming paradox of caste's invisibility in the rural India is not surprising, since the urban sphere is almost entirely dominated by upper castes. As sociologist Satish Deshpande shows and contends that this homogeneity makes caste drop below the threshold of social visibility. If almost everyone around is upper caste, caste identity is unlikely to be an issue. Deshpande also argues that the Indian state since the independence has imposed, and I'm quoting his words, the official and social moral ban on public discussion of caste, unquote. And this brings out the main contradiction in the state's attitude towards caste, its willful misrecognition and truncation of exclusion and discrimination as merely deprivation and disadvantage. By treating reservation as a welfare program and covering up the language of backwardness have brought us where we are today. As India is an electoral democracy, caste upsets the upper caste that Deshpande describes as an uh, 
I'm quoting his words again, the most powerful and most pampered minority, unquote. These are also the most elusive social groups in statistical terms, and they dislike only one thing about caste. It's used by the caste subjugated to demand their democratic rights. The caste census data with its multidimensional social x-ray, they fear, will be a powerful tool in their hands. Thus, it is not accidental that the policy of reservation for the suppressed castes in India is the most badly implemented policy. Such callousness has given birth to what Pratap Mehta calls a deep and pervasive culture of avoidance, which only makes matters worse. He wrote this in his brilliant uh, 12, uh, 2012 essay, Breaking the Silence, How We Don't Talk About Inequality and How to Start Again. The title itself is quite revealing. Since then, Mehta and his fellow scholars have fallen silent on the subject. Instead, Mehta has recently written against caste census and the emergence of caste debate. In my view, this culture of avoidance emanates from a longest standing intellectual hypocrisy about caste and its consequences. It is a revealing fact that there are very few writings in Indian intellectual history that treat equality directly as a subject. India's great intellectuals, and many of them uh, were brilliantly introduced by my previous uh, 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 speaker, like the Sanskrit literati of ancient India have hardly produced any systemic tracts on equality. The academia has avoided any macro study of caste. Among our 5,000 scholarly terms on caste, there is hardly any that analyzes caste as an institutionalized discrimination. No wonder the school textbooks generally do not teach students about caste as discrimination. Instead, many of them now fancifully narrate the merits of the caste system. The sociology of knowledge makes clear the affinity between thought models and social position of the given, of given groups. The link between inherent identities and one's worldviews is well known. In India, this problem is particularly pernicious due to the long-standing elitist control over knowledge. Despite some challenging attempts from below in recent years, production and transmission of institutionalized knowledge remains in custody of caste elites who share a similar mental framework even though they have a variety of outlooks. This applies to the whole intellectual growth that reproduces India's history and culture in many devious ways. The lure to derive pleasure and profit from such misrepresentation is so great that secular champions of scientific temper, let alone celebrators of myths, tradition, and religion, fervently suppress inconvenient historical reality. In the 19th century, stressing the knowledge power nexus, Phule had denounced caste as slavery for the Dalit Bahujans and women, and he castigated the traditional custodians of knowledge as Kalam Kasai, the pain-wielding butchers. In the 20th century, Ambedkar bemoaned the fact that he was the only non-Brahman scholar of his time, and he cautioned the Constituent Assembly that, and I'm, I'm quoting his uh, famous words, democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic, unquote. Phule, Ambedkar, and other anti-caste thinkers like Periyar had rightly traced the roots of cumulative dominance of the few and cumulative demoralization of the multitude in the historical exclusion of the lower castes and women from the realm of education and its manifold consequences. Indeed, the lowered castes were not allowed to even imbibe the canonical knowledge, and their own organic knowledge evolved through experience was unrecognized, preventing the possibility of an alternate system emerging. This has been the real tragedy of India 
and this tragedy isn't even recognized by the academia. Thus, since the days of the Vedic Purushok, the foundational moment of caste ideology, the dominant knowledge production has been at loggerheads with humanity and dignity of the commoners and women. Those texts were actually a manifesto of a caste hierarchy and exclusion, a manifesto of keeping the masses and later for exploitation. All this was to nurture the caste philosophy that different castes and genders have different biological and psychological essences, and hence they have differential rights and duties made explicit in, shastri, in shastric uh, preachings like Varna Nam Brahmano Guru, Na Shudraya Mati Dadyat, and Na Istri Swatantriyam Arhati. Thus, justice was equated with inequality and righteousness was to adhere to the norms of caste and patriarchy within the inviolable walls of Varnashram Dharma. This can be better grasped with unraveling the popular stories of Eklavya, Shambhok, and Sita. Relentless religious propaganda indoctrinated the people with the values of caste and patriarchy, forcing them, often with political coercion and psychological manipulation to internalize self-oppressive norms and values. That slavery is inborn in shudras and women is a common refrain in the religious texts. However, the scholars who spend a lifetime in researching the past remain forever blind to this historical reality. When they describe tradition and civilization, real history evaporates, actual meanings in the Sanskrit text are muted, and what one gets is a distilled, idealized version of the dharma and varn vevastha. With amazing intellectual jugglery and hotspa, the ancient texts are held up as a model of glorious social ethics. Its basic philosophy of social discrimination is usually drowned in fantastic elaboration on some stray ethical verse, didactic phrase, and abstract or abstract philosophical proposition. The Vedantic metaphysical unity of Atman with Brahman is celebrated <coughs> as the splendid spirituality without bothering to grasp how such ideals were interpreted in the real world where social cruelties and corruption festered just beneath the veneer of the sublime. The fact that in order to identify Atman or Brahman, Atman has to be separated from the empirical self betrays the utter irrelevance of such ideals in actual life. Thus, the pattern doesn't change when we move forward to the history of modern India. I would argue that the spirit of Purushok is still being reproduced grossly or subtly with nuance with the same intent of misrepresenting the social reality, though in a vastly different language and idioms. This explains the absence of any fundamental questioning of traditional structures, normalization of caste and Brahminism, and the identification of upper caste culture with Indian culture. If you are critical of caste and Brahminism, you are e Eurocentric and guilty of denigration of the civilizational ethos of India. Wonderful theories such as caste is a colonial construction of fabrication of the population surveys and census reports are being invented under the banner of post-coloniality, whitewashing centuries of violence of caste and patriarchy. It is worth pointing out that not long ago, democracy too was denigrated as a Western thing, unsuitable for India, although it recently attained mysterious, immaculate maternity in India, mother of democracy. I'm not taking any name. In these ways and others, an obscurantist impression is being created that all problems of contemporary India, and especially the caste question, emanated from the Western colonialism. In Azaz Ahmed's words, and I'm quoting him, colonialism is now held responsible 
not only for its own cruelties, but conveniently enough for ours too, unquote. The influence which entrenched interest, interest is still exerts over all channels of communication, from the elite academia to the mass media, ensures a perpetual ambience of brainwashing. The opinion business, the persuasion industry, range from sophisticated academic treaties to the stereotype crudities of the infotainment industry. Invented histories, myth-making, and armory of stereotypes merge seamlessly to create convenient narratives and myths which masquerade as the history of India. Even those who accept the injustices of caste and patriarchy hasten to add the pointlessness of raking them up as if those things have become history. But the suppressed story mothers the lies. That is why the stories of Eklavya, Shambok, and Sita should not be forgotten. Symbolic characters like them are few in the epics, but there must have been millions in the real life, and their descendants have not yet been fully emancipated. That is why the distorted accounts of the past and present must be countered wherever one encounters it. Dominance must be defeated with resistance. The resistance that knows that the master's tool will not bring down the master's house. The best resistance is a creative one, a movement that emerges from reconstructing a new democratic culture of inclusivity and diversity. This is a necessary task because no paradigm of the past, list of all the iniquitous culture of caste, can be the model for our time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brajanjan and Mani. Uh, it was a brilliant talk. Um, I really liked the, the thing you talked about, the caste paranoia and the culture of avoidance of Savarna intellectuals in media and academia, about the schooling revolution, which, which you know, uh, which in some ways is a larger problem. Um, uh, with this, uh, we will move on to the next uh, presentation uh, with Dhrubo Jyoti. Let me introduce uh, Dhrubo. Dhrubo Jyoti is Senior Editor Views and News Operations at Hindustan Times, a Dalit queer journalist and writer. They write on national affairs at the intersection of caste and sexuality and are interested in centering caste marginalized voices in India's LGBTQIA plus movements. Dhrubo. Yeah, and I must say that uh, this batch is doing a far better job of staying awake after lunch than we ever did. Um, afternoons must begin uh, with miracles, right? So uh, I thought we would begin with three. First, aptitude, right? Some students always, some children always seem more prepared. Uh, more culturally aware, more keen, uh, while others seem more unsure. Some have all the cultural cues, uh, some know which band is cool, uh, which prog rock uh, song is coming back into vogue, uh, and others don't, right? Uh, so if someone's a lazy genius and someone else is just lazy, you need to ask why, right? Um, second uh, miracle is opportunity. Mm. Do you know somebody who's getting their book published at 22 uh, just because they uh, met a sought-after book agent at a dinner? Uh, or maybe somebody else miraculously knew the deadlines for some fellowship uh, because their cousin is on the board, right? Uh, miracles. Uh, the third miracle is merit, right? We are surrounded by smart people. Uh, but accidentally, all those smart people are coming from four subcasts. Uh, all went to three specific schools in a particular city, and all live in two neighborhoods. Right? Uh, but don't worry, because they all have uh, deeply thought out, nuanced positions on what's happening in Armenia, in uh, you know various other, and, and what happened in some uh, obscure parts of the world. Right? The third miracle. Uh, this is not to say that 
these concepts of aptitude, of opportunity, of merit, uh, don't mean anything or that they are meaningless. Uh, what I only want to say uh, is that something else is going on, right? These are not uh, uh, things that have no weight in themselves. Right? Uh, and this is to also say, to take off uh, from uh, some of this brilliant work that's been presented this afternoon, uh, uh, to, to emphasize the point that caste can be found in the unlikeliest of spaces, right? Uh, and most likely in the lives of people around us, uh, and not communities that have had little to do with spreading caste discrimination and bias, right? So the next time somebody wants to go out on a caste assignment, maybe this would be a good thing to remember. Um, and, and therefore, uh, my uh, understanding of diversity in the media is slightly different uh, from a lot of media scholars uh, who seem to think that journalism doesn't, uh, an unrepresentative uh, uh, media doesn't hold an appropriate mirror to society. I think in a caste stratified society, actually media is doing a great job of showing uh, what stratification means by exactly replicating those cleavages in the media. Right? Um, so then what happens when, and because uh, one is queer and I've worn a little color to show the heteros that one is, uh, right? So what happens when using these kinds of lenses, uh, we cover something like gender and sexuality, right? Um, and, and, and this is then the next part of the uh, 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 conversation because uh, the first thing we were taught in ACJ was that every story must have a beginning, a middle and an end. Right, so the beginning uh, are the three miracles. The middle is what we are doing, and the end, hopefully, we will come uh, to in a bit. Um, so what happens when we use these lenses to cover questions of gender and sexuality in India and more broadly South Asia, right? So the first thing, perspective, right? Uh, what sort of issues matter, right? So if, you, if you're looking at uh, queer folk, if you're looking at uh, gender marginalized people, uh, what kind of things are you seeing? Uh, what kind of people are you talking to? Uh, are we maybe talking to people who look like us, uh, whose language we understand and are comfortable with, whom we are meeting at uh, cultural entertainment spaces that we are going to? Uh, what kind of stories are animating us? Uh, are we thinking of uh, Maybe like, you know, the usual kind of stories of hunger and destitution are boring. Uh, and so we need more exciting stories of love and marriage, right? Uh, how entitled do we feel to tell those stories, uh, right? So people do, uh, for example, lots of training in specialized subjects, right? And uh, uh, I mean, journalism schools do a great job of this. Uh, but how entitled do we feel in telling stories of uh, deeply felt uh, caste experiences, right? What kind of specialization do you need to tell those stories? What is a gender story, right? What's a sexuality story? How do you think of, um, or how do I think of doing questions of gender and sexuality in a way that, uh, or can it ever be divorced from caste? So to, to uh, connect a dot from uh, uh, something that was said uh, first thing this morning, um, right? So, so for example, Hathras, right? 2020, uh, this woman is brutalized, is killed, creates this big movement. Uh, was that a gender story though, right? Uh, what kinds of ways in which do we need to think about society to truly tell a rounded uh, to truly draw a rounded picture uh, in our newspapers, in our, uh, on our television channels, in our magazines, uh, right? And, and what are the things that we are leaving behind uh, because we have been beneficiaries of one of those three miracles, right? Of uh, opportunity, of merit, uh, and of aptitude. Right? Uh, then the second thing is um, of respectability, right? Um, and respectability, not just in the sense of uh, what's good or who looks well, but in terms of uh, which kinds of people are approachable. What kind of people do we think would look good in our newspapers, in our, in our magazines, on, our, on the television, right? Uh, what sort of diction should they have, uh, right? What sort of clothes should they wear? What kind of stories do we seek, right? So if you're, if you're looking at, say, uh, 
queer folk, and suddenly you see lots of stories of urban love, you should, should be very, very suspicious, okay? Because uh, what is love? And how are queer people getting it when other people are not getting it, right? So if, it's true, so if caste marginalized folks are getting killed, right, for going out on a date, who are these queer people who are able to go to the Supreme Court? Right? Uh, who do we humanize, right? Uh, who do we not humanize? Uh, whose consent do we seek when we photograph them? Uh, who do we quote as experts, right? Uh, who do we not see as experts, right? So um, one thing that we often do is there are folks who tell us stories and there are folks who theorize on stories. Right, as uh, we do in the uh, in, in in the media, right. So, uh, questions of respectability are those that tell us this is a person who's only fit enough to tell us their story of suffering, and this is another person who will then tell us what that suffering means, uh, because the first person is not either looking respectable enough or has the right language uh, to tell us about their own world, right. And the third. Uh, is of objectivity, right? Uh, what's a neutral arbiter, right? What communities get to be unmarked? Uh, have we ever seen folks from certain privileged communities being told, no, you can't cover uh, parliament or the budget or finance because actually your communities are making them, right? Do you ever hear folks from dominant communities barred uh, or being given lessons in objectivity? Uh, who's neutral? And how different would something look uh, if there were not a large gamut of issues and then there was a small gamut of queer issues, caste issues, questions of gender, right? Uh, in the last 20 years, we have seen, for example, in mainstream press, and I'm a big defender of legacy media, uh, in mainstream press where we have seen uh, actually lots of people talking about how there is no separate, there should not be a gender beat Right? or a gender story. Every story is a gender story. Right? Uh, because there is no aspect in this world that doesn't touch women and trans folk. Um, similarly, what's a caste story? Right? Do we know of a region in this country where caste is not an issue? Uh, or at least in the mainland of this country where caste is not an issue? I don't. Right? Uh, and finally, what does it do to our understanding of the media and of our own selves, right? I think it does, again, three things. And sorry for this recurrence of three. One didn't have a lot of time uh, with Akash uh, saying send presentation now. Um, the first thing is of audience, right? Uh, whenever we go into newsrooms, we are told about, uh, we're told of to think about the audience, right? To write with an audience in mind. Uh, but who do we think is reading us? Right? If there are only certain communities who are present in the newsroom, uh, then those communities get to decide what priority of news should be, what is worthy of being covered, and who they think are reading. Right? Uh, how accurate could that news be? How accurate could those, so we are often told about um, how in journalism, and as it should be, uh, how facts are sacred. Right? Uh, but look who's disseminating those facts. Right? If certain communities are in charge of deciding what's a worthy enough fact and what's not, uh, what's worthy of coverage and what's not, then we need to go back and think about audience. Right? And finally, of history. Right? Caste is a conspiracy of forgetting, to dehumanize by amnesia. Right? So even as caste marginalized journalists and writers come together, uh, their lives are precarious, right? Because they fear for things that others can take for granted. This could be loneliness, grief, NOI, skin hunger, unrootedness, and just a bad day. If you don't have networks, uh, even the simplest of problems can be debilitating. Right? Um, which is why for caste marginalized folks, histories are important. For example, uh, I came to this uh, excellent institution that taught me almost everything I know today and then went on and uh, I mean, I'm half Bengali and the Bengali part of me is that I went, I got one job out of ACJ and I've not moved from that job, All right? So it's a bit of a, 
uh, you know, like a government knockery kind of thing. Uh, but the reason I, one was able to do it is because one knew of uh, folks from caste marginalized backgrounds who were doing excellent work. And uh, one of those people, Sudipto Mandal, is also an alumnus of this, of, of this institution, um, who taught me about how one has to be courageous in the everyday. Right? And, and I think that's both the brilliance and the tragedy of caste marginalized folks, right? that you have to brave everything every day in ways that other people do not have to think of. Right? So you have the luxury uh, to ignore what other people can't ignore. And the reason one mentions this is because um, if, any, if, if Sudipto uh, ever came to th this institution, as he often has in the past, you would see that we are very different people, right? He's like one uh, big hetero who just goes to, uh, 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 who'll be like, oh, what is the point of breathing? And I will go for like four days into uh, the field and not do this, whereas you know, I'm like more civilized and you can't do that stuff anymore. Um, <laughs> the point being, however, that there is no one kind of Dalit person. In the same way that is, there is no one kind of Dalit journalist. And there is no one kind of story that we want to tell. Uh, we want to tell all kinds of stories, right? I want to actually one day not do uh, politics and all this uh, elections, but was, and I want to actually go and cover all those exciting parties that Karan Johar seems to throw where only foreign journalists keep getting invited, right? Um, and hopefully one day we will have a uh, diverse and liberated enough media, uh, thanks to institutions like these and uh, occasions like this, where we will uh, be able to give uh, Dalit people not just jobs, uh, but jobs that they dream of, right? Um, and I want to end by uh, maybe going to uh, the image at the end. And uh, the reason that this is important to me, and again connects to what Sunena Arya was talking about in the morning, and she's a big pioneer, so we're all very lucky to have her with us, is to, yes, the last one. Yeah, these are images of seven men, right? Over the last four years, these men were attacked and killed for sitting cross-legged, having a mustache, having social media profiles, riding a horse, drinking water, wearing their hair long, being feminine, shunning manual scavenging, studying, being disabled, and stepping out of their own home, right? There are countless more Dalit women and Dalit queer trans people uh, from caste marginalized backgrounds whose death, as is often their lives, were invisibilized. But I've chosen these men uh, because some of these stories that we have covered personally have stayed with me long after reporting on them because of their potential for ordinariness, right? The relentless defiant pursuit of happiness and actually how little it takes uh, for a caste marginalized person to fall afoul of caste strictures, right? Uh, to me, these men showed that notions of gender and sexuality that are shaped from caste privileged backgrounds have little relevance, not just for Dalit lives, but also in caste societies where gender and queer solidarities are neatly caste stratified, right? Uh, so uh, queer scholars will uh, tell you about gender hierarchies, and yet Dalit men are getting killed for sitting cross-legged, right? Uh, the other bit that's really exciting and simultaneously heartbreaking for me is that uh, when we meet many of their families, we see that their dreams were modest, right? Some wanted to finish their engineering degrees, some wanted to get a decent job, provide for their families and pull them out of poverty. Some liked to hum film tunes, some were introverts, some wanted to become a police officer and some uh, many of them in North India wanted to become like Virat Kohli, right? They were men, and but for their caste location, they could have enjoyed the privilege of unmarked individualism that caste elites in India take for granted. Right? So therefore, unlike what upper caste uh, theorists would have you believe, their deaths, uh, unfortunate as they are, show that caste is a very real determinant of gender and sexuality and actually subsumes sometimes all of it, right? And that there is nothing beyond in sexuality uh, than caste sometimes, right? Uh, this is a devastating loss. Uh, 
uh, we struggle to hold on to their lives, uh, their dreams, uh, or stand by their families. We struggle to make this loss legible to the rest of the world. This loss is debilitating because as much as it comes in the news uh, and a, a, a numbing amount of news uh, is dedicated to caste-based hate crimes, it doesn't seem to change how societies see violence, how they see love, affection, desire or touch. On occasion, it seems that nobody but our communities have a stake in this fight for dignity. We are here today with the hope that it changes now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Drubo. That was uh, a brilliant class, I would say, for our students. Um, one thing about what is a gender story, what is a caste story, you know, it's something that we have also talked about in classes that caste is something that even if you're writing about art, cinema, or anything, you know, food, there's no way that, you know, this doesn't intersect with that uh, question, you know. Um, we will move on to the next speaker, next presentation with Rajesh Rajmani. Rajesh is a filmmaker and film essayist his writings offer a social commentary on mainstream Tamil cinema, and they have been published in The Wire, The News Minute, HuffPost India, First Post, and News Laundry. He won the Red Ink Award for the essay, The Dharavi Story in Tamil Cinema, How Kala Inverts the Nayakan Gaze under the Lifestyle and Entertainment category in 2018. His short films, The Discreet Charm of Savarnas, 2020, Haiku Love, 2023, and Lovers in the Afternoon, 2019, were presented by Paranjit's Neelam Productions and they have received critical accolades. He holds an engineering degree from Madras University and a postgraduate degree in management from IIM Indore. Prior to pursuing filmmaking, Rajesh worked in the retail department of a private bank in Mumbai. He is currently based out of Chennai. Rajesh. Thanks to the organizers you know, for inviting me for this conversation. Um, so, uh, so, you know, when Akash contacted me, he asked me, you know, do you want to talk about, uh, you know, Dalits in Tamil cinema? And I said, why should we talk about Dalits in Tamil cinema? You know, because, you know, why only talk about Dalits? You know, uh, cinema, like any other form of media, you know, there is caste is an integral part of anything in India. So if you talk about Tamil cinema or Indian cinema, what it's more important is to talk about caste as a, as, a, as a complete concept and not just focus on Dalits. You know, Dalits are just the end of the spectrum. You know, there's Brahmins, there's so many other castes in between. And Dalits are the end. So, 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 so you, you have to reach Dalits only before talking about the rest of the other communities and how they are represented in, in Tamil cinema or Indian cinema. So, so I want to talk about you know, how caste uh, has played out in Tamil cinema and, and, and how criticism exists uh, in, in various forms today. Uh, the first thing, you know, uh, we think of Indian cinema as something that's really uh, existing, but that there's nothing really like Indian cinema, actually, because uh, for Indian cinema to exist, it has to be anchored in a particular geography. You know, we often think of Bollywood as Indian cinema, but Bollywood's, Bollywood is not anchored anywhere. It's produced from Bombay, but it's not telling the stories of Mumbaikas. You know, it's, it's, not it's not really, you know, anchored or it's not telling the stories of any particular landscape, you know, which is why Bollywood always focuses on, it, it tries to escape the land, uh, you know, anchoring problem. So the stories are about NRIs who are away from India. Uh, it talks about sports, which sort of unifies the, uh, you know, unifies the country. You know, there's a certain national uh, fervor in sports, so it talks about sports. And, and Bollywood talks about uh, border problems, which again creates a certain sense of nationalism. So uh, Bollywood exists on this creation of this nationalism, and, and it, it tries to be casteless. You know, the only, because, no, because there's no two castes are same in, in, in this Indian subcontinent, right? You know, the, you know, the Baniyas from Gujarat are not the same as the Chattiyas in Tamil Nadu. There's nothing really connects them. You know, they might be uh, traders, but, you know, in terms of culturally, economically, socially, they're not the same communities. The only community which sort of unites India is the Brahmin, you know, so which is why uh, the Brahmins are present in Bollywood, but nobody else is generally present, you know. Otherwise, Bollywood is pretty casteless. 
But regional cinema cannot escape caste, you know, because regional cinema is located in a particular location. You know, you look at Telugu cinema, you look at Tamil cinema, then there is a, the story is located in Madurai or it's in Chennai or, you know, so then when you locate it in a particular space, then you cannot escape caste. You know, you have to acknowledge caste and you have to deal with it. It may not be a very smooth relationship, but uh, Tamil cinema acknowledges and there is continuous conversation of caste in Tamil cinema. Not just today, uh, you know, since its beginning, the Tamil cinema has sort of uh, you know, had this conversation with caste. Um, in the 1940s, in the 1940s, we, you know, we saw the completely studio set up. You know, there was this AVM Studios, there was this Vaini Studios, Gemini. So these were all controlled by either Brahmins or the other Savarnas, like, you know, the Rediyas, the Naidus, the Kama Naidus in particular, uh, or the Chetiyas, you know, the AVM, you know. Um, and they control the production of film, you know. Uh, you, know the, you know, these people, you know, filmmakers were from these communities, producers were from these communities, a lot of actors, musicians, they were all from primarily from these four, five, six very, uh, you know, Brahmin and other, uh, you know, powerful Savarna communities. Uh, so th this happened, you know, d during the studio setup. And, and here, you know, during this time, you know, the films were uh, heavily influenced by two things. One is the Hollywood, you know, in terms of their technical uh, advancements, lighting, sound, uh, performances, staging, these are all borrowed from, you know, the classical Hollywood at that time. Uh, at the same time, the cinema was also borrowing a lot from the Indian, uh, you know, theater system. You know, there was, uh, you know, there's this, this folk tales, there's mythological tales, you know, there was Thrible Adal, and there is, you know, all these, you know, popular films of that time produced by the studio were uh, on, on religious stuff, based on religious texts, or they were, uh, if, if they moved away from this folk and religious stuff, then they moved to freedom fight related stuff, you know, which had a always a Gandhian touch to it, you know. It, it talked a lot about freedom, freedom, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, freedom fighters or stories or, or something that was always uh, Gandhian in nature. Um, but it's only after the Dravidian movement, you know, the Dravidian movement, uh, you know, in the, the 60s and the 50s, 60s, when it started coming up, uh, you know, the, the rise of the Dravidian movement, then it started influencing cinema as well. You know, in, in 1952 is when Kalingal this Parasakti released. And I think that changed the face of Tamil cinema, you know, which is something which put it ahead of the rest of Indian cinema. I mean, what I mean by Indian cinema is the cinema that's produced in other parts of the country. That's because uh, they directly dealt with the politics of the state, you know. Uh, they talked about the values of Periyar, they talked about anti-caste, politics was brought to cinema, atheism was brought to cinema, you know, class issues was brought to cinema. So all this was talked in an extremely direct, uh, you know, very blunt manner, which was not done, you know, until then. Uh, but you also see this particular influence of Dravidian cinema, you find that it was greatly influenced not by directors, but actually by screenwriters. There was, you know, C.N. Anadurai and Kalang Karnandi, both of them were chief minister of the state. Uh, you know, they were important screenwriters of that time. And then there were actors like N.S. Krishnan, M.G. Ramachandran, Shivaji Ganeshan, M.R. Radha, and S.S. Sandran. They greatly influenced, uh, you know, they were very active members of the Dravidian politics. Uh, sometimes they moved away from the Dravidian politics too, but they, they had some relationship with the Dravidian ideology and that greatly influenced uh, their films. Um, but it, it was after the Dravidian movement, you know, the major important thing that happened was uh, the coming of uh, Bharati Raja. You know, Bharati Raja made his first film in 1977. So, you know, from the studio setup, now the cinema has come to the you know, come to the location, you know. You know, so they were shot on location. So he took the camera to, you know, small rural locations, uh, small seaside towns and villages, and he, he, he shot his films there. And, and he, one thing that, you know, was very particular about his films is that he told the stories of Bhajan. Uh, you know, Bhargaraja himself comes from a Deva community, which is an OBC community. Uh, though most of his stories are located in, you know, the OBC caste uh, or in Deva in particular, there was a broad uh, Bhaujan representation in his films. He was able to capture a broad cultural uh, shared by all the Bhaujans. When I say Bhaujans, you know, I'm talking about the lower caste, the OBCs and the SCs, you know. So he was able to, in terms of, you know, the festivals they celebrate, and the food they eat, you know, in terms of uh, how do they celebrate birth, you know, what happens during a death, you know, all this, you know, rituals and ceremonies of the average Bhaujan, you know. Uh, even, even if it's located on his, in its own community, he was able to sort of attract uh, uh, a broad Bhaujan appeal in his films. Um, after the success of Bharati Raja, you know, he greatly influenced 
you know, Tasim of his times. And after his influence, uh, several of his assistants and his own, and, uh, his assistants, assistants, and, and several people from smaller towns and villages. You know, most of these men were uh, Belgians. You know, they were always most of them for OBCs and a few from SE communities. They started making films. You know, they started entering into Tamil cinema, which was until then, you know, a Brahmin and other Savana sort of dominated space. You know, it, 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 cinema, which was once an intellectual sort of space, became a mass media in real terms, you know. It became, it started telling the story of the masses. And when I say masses, it's the Belgian masses, you know. So it started telling their stories in cinema during this phase. Uh, and during this time, then during this 80s, uh, there was also conversation and cast, you know. One thing uh, that the Bhardiraja was able, Bhardiraja and some of his followers were able to do is that, uh, you know, they, you know, they represented Belgians on screen. They were able to tell their stories with, uh, with a lot of humanity, you know. It's, it's not necessarily, most of the films are not necessarily anti-caste in nature, but uh, they had an anti-caste value, I would say, for just documenting the Belgians' lives with all its beauty and ugliness and everything, you know. But there was, at the same time, there was also a conversation on caste in their films. You know, in Bharadraja's film, Alegaloi Vidale, you know, he tries to talk about the Nada community, a Christian Nada community, which is an affluent community, and a Brahmin community, which is sort of poor. You know, he brings in a class caste equation and also a religious equation. You know, he brings class caste religious equations and discusses how these two communities are able to interact with each other in the society. And in Vedam Pudidu, he went back to his own community and talked about interaction between a Devar boy and a Brahmin girl. You know, so, so it's sort of a, uh, you know, uh, like he, he, he critiqued Brahmins in the film but at the same time, he also critiqued the Brahminization of his own caste, which is the Deva community. It's one of the interesting films. It's one of the very progressive films, I think, in Tamil cinema, where a filmmaker has self-critiqued his own community, which I think has not happened anywhere else in India or any, even in other Tamil cinema. So he was able to critique his own caste. At the same time, he was able to critique the caste system and the Brahmins. Uh, and in, you know, in Baki Raj, Baki Raj was also one of the assistants of Bharati Raja. He, he made an important film called Idhinama Alu where he was able to talk about the interaction between uh, the Navidar community, and the Navidars were the, Bra the Baba community, between the Navidars and the Brahmins. So one thing you've, you see in the films of the 80s was that most, these filmmakers from the OBC communities, they were able to talk about caste from the point of view of their own communities and the interaction with the Brahmins. So it was always the conversation was between the Brahmins and the OBCs in these films. Uh, at the same time, when, when all this was happening, uh, you know, from these Belgian ba uh, filmmakers in the 80s and early 90s. There was also, uh, you know, 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there was also uh, a Brahmin anxiety in films with, with the increased Belgianization of, of Tamil cinema. Uh, in the films of K. Balachandran and Manitram, you often found a Brahmin or Savarna protagonist, you know, and through them, they were able to document the stories of the Brahmins or look at the socio-cultural changes through the Brahmin protagonist. And once in a while, you know, I mean, this is a habit of K. Balachandran and Maniratnam. They'll substitute the Brahmin with the Mudaliyar or a Pillai as a surrogate caste and, and still, you know, document the Brahmin accent, uh, anxieties through them. You know, in, in this film, K. Balachandran's film, Vaname Ele, you know, uh, which, which actually just came a couple of years after, uh, you know, the VP Singh government, you know, recommended the Mandal Commission to be implemented. So he made a film, which is an anti-reservation film. He made an anti-reservation film. And he didn't use the Brahmin as the character to say that. He used the Mudaliyar, another Savarna caste, you know, to, to, to talk, to sort of represent the anxieties of the Brahmin. Uh, and uh, in, in the films of Maniratan too, you, you, you often find that. You know, in Roja, of course, in Roja, you find a Brahmin protagonist, you know, who sort of shares his anxiety about the Indian national integrity, you know. But, but in real life, you know, if you look at the Baujans in Tamil Nadu, you know, uh, Baujans living in, you know, Tirnelveli or you know, Kanyakumari, they don't give a damn about Kashmir. They don't have a stake in Kashmir. They don't really care about Kashmir. Uh, it's often a Brahmin anxiety about Kashmir. You know, it's only the Brahmins who are so bothered about the in national integrity because it's, it's, that's what unites them. You know, India unites Brahmins, so, so it's, it's their anxiety, which sort of is shown as a Tamil, average Tamil's anxiety. Uh, also, at the same time, when, when Roja came, is also the time when, uh, you know, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated, so there's a lot of LTT-related conversations in Tamil Nadu on separatism, and you know, people looked at if Elam comes to, you know, Elam in Sri Lanka comes, uh, you know, comes alive, you know, then that could also affect the stability of Tamil Nadu. So there's this whole separatism talk in those years, and Roja sort of used Kashmir as an, you know, as a metaphor to talk about Tamil Nadu's own issues with separatism. Uh, 
um, and then again in, in, in Maniratham's film, uh, Bombay, he uses a Pillai character, you know, to talk about the India Muslim, so, so the Hindu Muslim conflict in Bombay. But again, you look at Tamil Nadu, the Hindu Muslim conflict, sorry, the Hindu Muslim conflict in Tamil Nadu is not the same as what happens in the film in Bombay. You know, hin Hindus and Muslims in Tamil Nadu, particularly the Southern, they, they share a very friendly relationship. You know, the, the, the sort of um, antagonism that you feel, in, you find in these films is not really a Tamil Nadu politics, at least for that time, you know. But, uh, you know, but Maniratnam still, you know, was able to capture these, uh, you know, these perspectives uh, from an average uh, Brahmin male's point of view. Um, and, and, this, and what happened in the 1990s, you know, another thing that happened in the 1990s is when, until, you know, the mid-1990s, uh, you know, films of Bharati Raja were all documenting the Bhaujan life. And, and uh, there's always this competition between Kamala Hassan and Rajinikanth, you know. It's always believed that Rajinikanth is the actor of the masses, which actually means that he represents the Bhaujan average man, you know. He, he represents the masses. He was, saying that his film sort of works well with the Bhaujan masses and Kamal Hassan is called the, you know, the actor of the classes, you know, which is just to mean that, you know, it's just a polite word to say that his films work well with the Brahmins and the Savana. So there's this clear market uh, stratification happening between them. Uh, and there's always a conflict between them, you know, because Kamal Hassan was considered always to be a very popular, uh, very talented actor, but he was never able to be as mass as uh, Rajni Ganth was. So I think one of his effort to break into this mass market, he made Deva Magan. And Deva Magan, uh, you know, uh, sort of commodified the Deva community, which was not until then done. You know, even though, you know, I mentioned about Bharati Raja earlier, you know, he told stories of Deva community. But it's only, in, but they were never commodified. They were just humanized in those films. It is only in Deva Magan, the, all the, you know, all the, you know, factors about Devas, whether it's about Shubhas Chandra Bose or whether about their, you know, the, you know, the, the criminal uh, act, which was once, uh, you know, which was once a part of their history. Uh, you know, all this were brought together and, and there was a certain, you know, there was a certain Devar pride, uh, uh, you know, there was a certain Devar pride which was brought into the film and that became a huge commercial success. Kamal Hassan was until then a class actor, suddenly became a mass actor with the success of Devar Magan and he was able to break into newer markets. He was able to break into the, what we call, uh, you know, traditionally as the BNC markets, the smaller towns and villages. Uh, and with the success of this Deva Magan, the complete Bhaujan cinema market got distorted. Until then, people were making films which represented their lives, and suddenly they realized that cash pride is, is, is a huge commodity in the market. So after Deva Magan, there was a slew of films, you know, from about Gounders, about, you know, Padayachi, basically based on the districts, you know, in the northern districts, it was the one year or the Padayachi related films. On the southern districts, it was the Deva related films. And the western districts, it was uh, films about Gounder. So there were too many films, you know, whether Chinna Gounder, Peri Gounder, Ponnu, Chinna Gounder, Peri Gounder. There were just dozens and dozens of films made during that period, which sort of, you know, uh, played to the pride of these few dominant land-owning caste. Uh, but at the same time in the 90s, you know, at the same time in the 90s is when, uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar's writings became very available in Tamil, you know, it became extensively available in Tamil. Until then, you know, what was available only in English uh, and to an English reading audience. Suddenly, you know, it's, it, the books became widespreadly available. They became freely available, uh, you know, to, to a lot of people. And uh, with the seeping of Ambedkar's writings, the Dalit movement sort of ga gained momentum, uh, which is when we also had, uh, you know, Vidhidhari Chirtegil Kachi in the northern districts, which was, started, you know, which was like, you know, which had the leadership of Thirmamalavan. And in the southern districts of Tamil Nadu, there was Krishna Sami uh, with his Pudhi Tamalagam. You know, so these, there was increased Dalit mobilization and assertion happening on ground. And we saw how this got, uh, you know, sort of influenced the Tamil cinema in the next decade. So a decade later, you know, a decade later of the, you know, once, once uh, you know, VCK and Pudhi Tamilagam, you know, Vidhidhari Dekachikal and Pudhi Tamilagam came to politics, uh, the, you know, they were obviously, you know, Dalit politics came into play because they were not very happy with the Dravidian politics. They thought uh, the Dravidian politics did not sufficiently answer or sufficiently talk about their own rights. So which is why they found that, you know, that we need this Dalit movement to talk about our problems and our rights. And, and that got influenced in Tamil cinema as well. You know, in, in 2007, we saw uh, Venkat Prabhu's uh, Chennai 28. Chennai 28, you know, mostly people look at it as a very gully cricket sort of film. It's a film locates, uh, you know, uh, street players in, in the North Madras, but it's actually an important anti-caste film. 
because until then, not Madras, a part of you know Chennai, which is always you know caricatured as the place with you know you know smugglers and you know what on violence and you know it's a place which was sort of all all the negative stereotypes. But he deliberately chose a, such a location and told a sports cinema. You know, he, he talked about the joy of playing gully cricket. And, and the film became such a big hit. And after the success of that film, Venkat Prabhu's Ashton, just like how earlier we saw in the, the Bhaujan cinema, we saw Bharati Raja coming in and then Bharati Raja Ashton's changing the face of Tamil cinema. Venkat Prabhu's Ashton started saying, changing Tamil cinema. So it was Ranjit who was, you know, Venkat Prabhu's Ashton. He made Atakati Kala Kabali. And in Atakati, you know, he initially he just it, it was a slice of life Dalit, a slice of life Dalit life cinema. You know, it, it just talked about romance and you know youngsters. Uh, but it, when it came to Kabali and Kala, there was increased Dalit assertion in his films. You know, uh, uh, so so he uh, also another thing you have to look at it in these films, even in Sarpatta Parambari, where you know uses sports as a form to um, uh, you know to to assert Dalits. Uh, you know, the Dalit's rights and power in cinema. Something that you see in these films is also that how they're somewhat similar to what Indian cinema does. You know, what Indian cinema does is it almost tries to become, it, it focuses on the Brahmin and tries to find a national appeal. But what Venkat Prabhu and I think uh, particularly Ranjit's films did is they focused on the Bhaujan and still they tried to find a national appeal. So what he deliberately did is, is he focused on films on cricket. Uh, Venkat Prabhu's film and in Ranjit's film, Sarpata Parambari, he focused on boxing. So once it becomes about sports, it becomes easy for to find a national appeal. And in, in his film, Kabali, he deliberately located the story in Malaysia because once you pull the story out of Chennai land, you can easily find a national appeal. So he put his film in Malaysia, Kabali, uh, you know, and he talked about the, you know, the migrant laborers there and, and then he was able to find a national appeal to his film. And he also, of course, had Rajinikanth, which got him a, a sort of national appeal. And again, in, uh, in Kala, he took the story out of Tamil Nadu, he put it, uh, you know, he put the story in, in, in the Tamil migrant labors of Dharavi. So once the story became located in Dharavi, it again got a national appeal. So something that deliberately Ranjit has been doing is he's been trying to marry this national appeal with, with telling very rooted Dalit or Bhajan stories. Um, and once the success of, you know, the commercial success of Ranjit's films, you know, gave rise to his own production, Neelam production, uh, and he's been able to, you know, bring in a lot of other Dalit and other Bhajan filmmakers who's been able to tell very, uh, very directly political films. You know, there's no beating around the bush anymore. You know, uh, you know, and and these films, do, these films do both things. They document the Dalit life and they also talk about their politics in a very direct way. And that's what you saw in Peri, Parir in Perimal. You know, Parir in Perimal, uh, you know, it sort of captured the trials and turbulations of a, you know, of a Dalit man, and it also try to evoke the humanity of the oppressors. You know, a film like this we've not seen earlier, you know. Uh, we've had conversations, in, even this Bharadraja time, we had conversations, but uh, a film which directly attacked the caste system like Parir and Perimal and evoking the humanity of the oppressor, we've not seen that uh, before this. Uh, but this also, you know, but, 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 you know, particularly after the advent of Ranjit's films and after, you know, what you saw and after the death of Rohit Vemula, uh, you know, there's been this increased attention to, you know, everything on cast, you know, like, you know, there's, a, everybody now wants to write on cast, there are so many books being printed on cast, English media is like, people are just, either they are recruiting people who want to write on cast, or they're just getting freelancers who want to write, there's this media, academia, cinema, there's this increased attention to cast, which also sort of now made anti-cast conversation, initially we had a sort of a very organic growth, but now there is this very there's this very aggressive growth which is uh, you know which has sort of led, led to a sort of commodification of anti caste articulation in Tamil cinema as well. So we saw in the case of Vetri Maran's Asuran, you know, where he just converted uh, an anti caste. I mean, he basically played a pulp drama, a pulp revenge drama like Django Unchained, you know. But maybe he, he just put that story into a OBC Dalit conflict, you know. So so just revenge dramas. And, and, and pulp dramas are now presented as Dalit stories, you know, because, because there's an in increased capitalization, all big heroes from, once Rajingan saw, you know, uh, some success in these films, you know, every other top actor now wants to act in films which are about Dalits, because this is a new market and there is so much interest in youngsters uh, on caste and anti-caste articulations. So, so, uh, so there's a, this commodification has led to 
a, a sort of a quick formula where violence is used as a quick formula in these films, which we saw in not only Asuran, but even Mari Selvaraj. So earlier, Mari Selvaraj made a very personal film in Pariyar in Piramal, but in Karnan, he too, you know, gave the Dalit man a sword, you know, and, and violence, as a, as violence and Dalit assertion has now become some sort of a commodity in these films. Um, but, but this is what's happening in Tamil cinema, you know, uh, but primarily happening in Tamil cinema. But you look at even, you know, at the periphery of Tamil cinema and in, in outside, uh, you know, Tamil cinema in, in, in Bollywood or other states, you find that everybody wants a, everybody wants a piece of this pie, you know, this anti-caste art question, but nobody wants to really engage with, uh, you know, uh, caste or, you know, anti-caste articulation. So what they do is they easily want to make films on honor killing, you know, we saw a Netflix anthology called Pava Kadigal, which is just about honor killing, or, or there is about, there's increased attention on, uh, you know, sexual violence on Dalit women, as we saw in Article 15 and other films, or it's about manual scavenging. So they, anything to do on caste, they only want to talk about these things, honor killings, manual scavenging deaths, or sexual violence on women. So what initially started as an organic conversation on caste has now quickly reduced to a, uh, certain uh, pulp commercialization and, and, and violence is used as the only means to tell these stories. And you know, I mean, we all, I mean the earlier speakers talked about Eman Srinivas, a Sanskrit edition, but what's happening in Tamil cinema is sort of a reverse of that, you know, everybody wants to be Baujan now. There's Baujanization of Tamil cinema. So, you know, we, we, you know every, everybody wants to appeal to the market. So even if you have nothing to do with uh, anti-caste politics, people put up image of Periyar and Ambedkar because it's like, it's like become an item song. You know, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate to say this, but you know, because they know that the moment the audience see a Periyar image or a Dr. Ambedkar image, they'll clap without even knowing why it's there or what's the point of it. So it's become, you know, there's this forced burgeonization of uh, you know, uh, Tamil cinema at this point of time. And you know, if you've seen the Surari portrait of a film by Sudha Kangara starring, uh, you know, Surya, in the film, the film actually tells the story of, uh, you know, Eric and founder, you know, Captain Gopinath. And Captain Gopinath is an Ayanga, you know, we f you can just find his details on, uh, on Wikipedia, and he's had a typical Ayangar wedding. Uh, in, in, but the film, his story is told as a story of a Baujan. An Ayangar's story, an Ayangar's ambition and aspiration for the sake of the film, it's converted into a Bhaujan story so that it can find a mass appeal. Because nobody cares about Ayanga's story on Tamil cinema anymore. You know, they want even Ayanga's story to find appeal, it has to be told as a Bhaujan story. So then the typical Ayanga wedding he had is now shown as a self-respect self -respect marriage in the film with images of Periyar Ambedkar, which never happened in his life. You know, but that's what sells today. You know, so Tamil cinema is desperate to make this, you know, anti-cast sales. Uh, in fact, this is not just in Tamil cinema, you know, you find this on social media, you find this on media everywhere, everybody wants to be a Baujan, you know, I mean, I just want to show this, you know, mention this anecdote uh, about somebody, you know, I know, I mean, I can't mention the person's name, of course, four years back, you know, the person, you know, she claimed to be a Brahmin in social media, uh, sort of a small celebrity in social media, she claimed to be a Brahmin, because, you know, she lived, I mean, her parents were intercaste marriage, I think, but she, they were divorced, and she lived with her mom, and, you know, four years back, she claimed she's a Brahmin. And three years back, she claimed, no, no, my father is a Baujan, so I'm sort of an intercaste person. And two years back, she said, my grandmother is an Adivasi. And this year, she's claimed she's a mixed Baujan. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the rate at which Brahmins are becoming Baujans is, is people are finding, oh, my neighbor is a Baujan. Maybe I'm also a little bit of a Baujan. You know, <laughs> my, uh, you know, I watch this, I watch, Raj, I, I like Ranjit's films. Maybe that makes me a little bit of a Baujan. You know, it's, it's, it's come to that. You know, everybody wants to be a Baujan today. You know, everyone wants, because it's like a, it's like a big pie, you know, big commercial market and everybody wants a, ch you know, pie of it, you know, uh, a share of the pie. So, so that, that's what, that's what is happening, not just in Tamil cinema, but, you know, all throughout you see in social media. Because you, you, not today you see in social media, everybody is Baujan, cure, and if you have a mental disability, then that's great. You know, because that's the most selling point. You know, ADHD, cure, Baujan, you are done. You know, you have everything in life. You know, you can just say everything and get away. You know, that's it. Because these marginalized communities have now become market labels, you know, and you can really become powerful by selling them. So, so everybody wants to be that. Uh, but you, you know, you look at you know Tamil cinema. There's something very interesting in how it divides its labor. You know, um, if today, the times I'm talking today in contemporary terms, uh, there are only few Brahmin savanna producers, but and, and then there are a, a significant number of directors and technicians. But most of the female actors, you look at them, they're all Brahmin or savanna. Uh, you hardly find Baujan women 
you know, representing the average. They always, either the Brahmin women or women from upper caste from outside Tamil Nadu brought in to represent the Tamil, average Tamil women. And musicians, singers, because again, of this old Carnatic tradition in Tamil Nadu, most of the singers and musicians tend to be Brahmins or other Southern people. And the, another important thing is how the English media is filled with film critics who are again Brahmin Savana. So this is like sort of taken over by Savana Brahmins. And look at the producers, most producers are Baujans, most directors are Baujans, technicians are Baujans. Almost all males are, except one or two, except one or two, most of the successful males actors actually uh, are Baujans. You know, in fact, to be honest, Brahmin actors, even they try hard to be Baujans in cinema. You know, they, they color them skin darker. You know, they're trying like actors like Arvind Swami, Siddharth, or Madhavan, they're struggling to gain a market here because they're rejected by the most audience, you know, so they try to play the ruffian, you know, rural character and it doesn't work. So then, you know, they, they go to OTT or something like that. So, but again, most of the blue collar workers in Tamil cinema are uh, again, Baujan male, uh, you know, the, 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 the the backbone of Tamil cinema is actually produced by, even though it doesn't matter who's producing them, who's beneficiary of it, but you look at the labor that goes in Tamil cinema, that's actually the Baujan male labor, you know, whether it's technician, whether it's light men, whether it's drivers, uh, you know, just like how in the construction infrastructure industry you find most of them are male Baujan workers, you know, in th most of the hard labor here is also done by, uh, you know, male Baujan men, I mean, male Baujans. So, so you look at the product style and broadly in Tamil cinema, it's, it's, it's produced by Baujans. Mostly Tamil cinema is produced by Baujans and the theatre going audience is also primarily Baujan male. You know, like the, the women audience is certainly much, much less compared to the you know, male audience which go to the theatre. But the film critics are all Brahmin Savarna. You know, it's, it's a very, uh, so produced by Baujans, consumed by Baujans, but the person who's telling what is good or bad is a Brahmin or Savarna. So, so, th 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 so this is the problem with the film criticism that's, you know, that's happening in, uh, you know, in, in, in Tamil uh, industry is that uh, the mainstream is filled with, uh, you know, mostly Brahmins. So you often find uh, in Tamil, I mean, in Bombay, in Chennai, you'll find it's an Ayer, Ayangar, or a Menan Nair. You know, it's like, it's most of them occupy these writing spaces. And you'll also find that there are more women than men because, you know, generally, you know, you look at all these media spaces, all the serious things like sports, politics, uh, economics, the male journalists take over, and all the you know cultural stuff like food, travel, arts, cinema, uh, it's taken over by upper caste, like Brahmin Savarnam women, and and Brahmin Savarnam men take the other stuff. So so so, uh, but what has happened is increasingly, um, social media has changed the color of film criticism as well, uh, with YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There are increasingly a lot of Baujan. Uh, Critics, you know, they're not paid for this, not paid for by any particular institution, but they find a way to make money through YouTube views or, or, or through Twitter shares. They make money through social media and they become increasingly more powerful. It's so much so that now all the traditional critics, you know, you look at somebody like Bharadwaj Rangan, he's a very important critic. He used to write for Hindu and then he used to write for, you know, Film Companion. Now he's become a YouTuber. He's no more a writer or a critic. He's become a YouTuber because he's fighting with the other faceless, nameless, Baujan critics, somebody like Blue Sate Maran. I don't know if you've heard of Blue Sate Maran. Blue Sate Maran is somebody who's, 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 who's super influential on Tamil cinema. He was a nobody. He just came up, he started talking YouTube, and he became a very powerful influencer that the, that the mainstream English-speaking writers are now imitating him to get audience. So, you know, so what happened is the, the traditional role of the film critic has sort of disappeared over time, and, and they are merely trying to ape the social media critics by trying to put out critics as quick as possible, make videos, and, 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 and the writing culture is sort of given up in this process. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, the, the, the mainstream critics have been losing their uh, influencing power uh, in, in telling what is good or bad cinema, because social media again has propelled uh, a, a Baujan, uh, you know, influences in, in that space as well. Uh, that's all I have, thank you. Our students also learned a lot. Uh, it was almost like a genealogy of Tamil cinema and how caste has, you know, intersected with it o over the years. Are there any questions? Has anyone? Okay. Okay. Uh, please, uh, you know, ask the question who the speaker you are referring to. Yeah. Kangsha. 
Hello. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Rajamani. Um, so, uh, first of all, I absolutely love the film. Uh, thank you for screening it. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding your... I have a couple of questions regarding uh, the presentation that you had earlier. Uh, uh, so, there are two questions. I'm going to ask them one by one. One is, uh, could you share the sources of the stats that you mentioned in the last part of your presentation where you were talking about representation of, uh, you know, uh, Savarnas and uh, people from uh, Bahujan uh, communities, etc. That's one. And the second one is, um, so as you mentioned in your presentation, Indian cinema as a whole is costless, so to speak, right? And uh, so their stories are not really... Uh, they aren't really uh, fixated or focused on one particular community, but a sentiment rather. Um, and I think it's because of that partly that, you know, people, all of us in general, are a little ambivalent about caste. Um, but Tamil cinema is different. So, um, do you think that because Tamil cinema has uh, such great uh, fixation and such great grasp over uh, local politics, uh, do you think that has in any way affected how caste works in, in Tamil Nadu? So these are the two questions that I have. Uh, uh, thanks for the questions. The first one, see, the first one is that, uh, you know, what I mentioned, you know, in terms of, you know, broadly the numbers, you know, I don't have specific numbers uh, because I am a film essayist myself. You know, the last six, seven years I've been, I write with multiple media houses, mul print media houses, and I'm also trying to make my feature film. So I, I talk to, you know, the studios here. So it's through my, through my primary understanding, you know, through my primary meeting with, you know, different media houses and also with, you know, the contemporary active producers, you know, the, you know, the films. And, you know, I, I mean, like over the six, seven years, I've built a network in both in media as well as in films. So it's, it's from my primary understanding uh, is where the, the figures are like, uh, which is why exactly I, I can't put a, you know, fixed number, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a broadly uh, what you, you know, what you sort of take from these spaces, what do you understand from these spaces? The number two question, what I would say is that, uh, you said whether the films are influencing the society. It's actually the other way around. The society is what influence the films, you know. Um, you know, uh, for first the politics has to happen in the society so that they can get reflected in the films. If you look at, you know, the Dalit representation in Tamil films, the Dalit movement started almost 10 years before these films started coming, 10 to 15 years what started in the 90s is what you're seeing in films today. It's almost taken 15 years for films to catch up to what's happening in uh, the society. So in Tamil cinema, you find films on anti caste through anti caste perspectives is because of the Dravidian movement and the Ambedkar Dalit movement. So unless you have a movement in the society, it does not get reflected to the films. You know, and, uh, films is just what? Films is uh, all art forms, including films, are a way of communication. It, it first has to happen in the society for people to talk about it. So in, in Tamil Nadu, it, it happens in the grassroots level first and then it gets reflected in our books first and then in cinema and, and media and academia. I think academia is the last one to catch up in general, yeah, so. Yeah, next. Yeah, anyone? Uh, please, I mean, if you have question from other speakers, it will be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question is to Rajamani sir only. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted to ask you, you, um, you mentioned films like Devar Magan and Karnan. So these films are of course like in the mainstream uh, Tamil cinema, these are some of the biggest films that have portrayed cast, right? So do you think the, the sort of characters that we see in those films, are they the ideal representation of the marginalized and the uh, my, uh, minorities? See, there's nothing like ideal representation, you know. I don't think any film we can point out and say that's ideal representation. These are all films, they put out a perspective, you know, and all these perspectives are existing in the society, whether it's Cash's perspective or an anti caste perspective, they're all from the society, they're all drawn from the society. What Devamagan did is, it was produced by a Brahmin filmmaker and it commodified Deva community, which the Deva filmmakers themselves didn't know they could do that, you know. It's only after the commercial success of Devamagan all Deva filmmakers said, oh, I, we didn't know that we have such a big market. And they all followed after that. You know, one thing I missed earlier mentioning is that Bharati Raja's film, until Deva Magan, were never commodifying his own community. But seeing the success of Deva Magan, he made another film called Pasamborn, where he starts glorifying the community. Or in, you know, in Taj Mahal, another film called Taj Mahal, he again glorifies the community. So even Deva filmmakers 
got to know that there's a commodified market for themselves only after the success of Deva Magan, which is not made by Deva. And in the case of Asuran also, I think there's a certain commodification and commercialization of, uh, you know, films with Dalit heroes happening. But I think that's not with Karnan, I would say. I think it was Asuran which did that. Asuran was the first film which had a Dalit hero, a protagonist, and hit the, with Danush, it hit the 100 crore market. Ranjit and Mari Silvaraj were making films. They didn't know that such a big market. They knew there was a decent market. The, you know, the enormous 100 crore market was proved by, again, by a non-Dalit filmmaker, who's Vetri Maran, you know, he comes from the OBC community. So often it's, it's a strange thing is a non-Deva and a non-Dalit are showing the commodification of market and everybody else is following that, you know. But in terms of ideal representation, there's nothing ideal, there's nothing like an ideal representation. Nobody's ever gonna make any ideal representation. We're all reflecting parts of the society in cinema is what I think. Uh, Rajesh and Drubo will be there, uh, so we, we, we can talk. Yeah. Uh, if you have written down your questions, you can hand them over to Shreya, and uh, she's here. Thank you. Uh, you can raise your hands, and she will come and collect the questions. Can I? Asima? Uh, so my question is for Rajiv. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so, sir, it's regarding the presentation you made where you spoke about the role of caste in Tamil cinema. So I was a little inquisitive to know about the role of gender. So, for instance, in Bollywood, we get to see that there is a pay disparity between the male actors and the female, uh, the actresses, I mean. So how would you describe the treatment towards women in Tamil cinema? I think it's, uh, you know, it's, I mean, there are two aspects to it. One, how are women represented in films? And two, what is happening to women working in the industry, right? Like in terms of are there enough, you know, women filmmakers, musicians, you know, that is, I think in terms of participation as, as, as uh, you know, as a labor force, that's been as bad as any other industry, you know, Tamil film industry, I would say it's maybe marginally, it could be better at moments of, you know, some years can be better, but, but overall, I don't think in terms of filmmakers, technicians, they're not any great, but only thing is there are certain roles which only women can do, like women singers, you know, female actors, you know, so those are obviously given to women because nobody else, if, I think if men can do it, they'll take them that too. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is the, how are women portrayed in films? So there are, I think there are broadly two, as I think I'll, I can divide that in three aspects. One is in the Balachandra films, uh, you know, the, the whole repression of Brahmin women, you know. He sort of represented Brahmin women in cinema and talked about their economic problems or often about, uh, you know, he, he talked a lot about their sexual freedom. You know, that's something which recurrently appears in his films. Uh, you know, their, their, their freedom to love, marry, uh, or divorce, separate, live alone. His, his uh, capturing of women uh, characters were like that. When it came to Bharati Raja, because Bharati Raja's films were again about Baujan women, he also very, did a very important job of uh, documenting Baujan women, where it's not about sexual freedom or, you know, love and romance, it's more about livelihood. You know, because for Baujan women, you know, they have to put the food on the plate, and that's their primary concern. That's something, you know, you often find when, you know, the Baujan men die, or they're, you know, they're drunkards, or, you know, so he's captured what a Baujan woman struggled to run a family. That's something he uh, captured his cinema. And to some extent, you see that in Paranjit's films, even though his, his films are all like, you know, very hero-centered, I think uh, people have appreciated the kind of Dalit women he's been able to uh, show on screen. So I think in terms of representation in these in politicized filmmakers, there's a, a, a decent representation, I would say. Even if in, when it comes to labor force, the things are not so great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First one was about in, uh, was in 1869, 
and then you had even uh, people like uh, Ratamala Srinivasan and uh, uh, Ayudhas Pandita, they had also started newspapers. And at one point of time, there were 150 Dalit publications in Tamil Nadu. Do you have a question, Arun? No, I said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I think uh, what's more important uh, as an observation would be that uh, I think, um, you know, the Hindu and Ayodhya Dasa, Sorupai Satamalan, if I'm right, they were started in the same year or similar years. But Hindu has survived, but Ayodhya Dasa, Sorupai Orupai Satamalan has not survived. I think that's a more important question and observation we have to make. Not just they, are, they were started. Why have they not survived? Why have they... Why those 150 journals, why were they not able to survive? It's a more important question to ask than just their beginning, you know, that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, my question is to the distinguished alumnus of the college, um, Dribble, sir. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, because when one is sitting with Rajesh, you don't expect anybody else to shine. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the abstracted realities especially. This was a very intellectually stimulating conversation. Uh, I was thinking about writers like uh, Ovi Vijayan and Marques who are considered to be the most influential writers of their times and the kind of writings that they have, they reflect their ideals and fragmented nature of the indigenous realities. So when we talk about literature and media, uh, one may look at caste and the representation of the queer from a huge lens, a vibrant lens. So, however, keeping in mind that new ideas can be also seen as ruptures instead of straightforward entry points. Do you think there's a cultural gap when it comes to double oppression and when we talk about thrice oppression, especially in terms of those who are most vulnerable, like children and women? Is there a cultural gap you see that is dividing because the ideas may be quite contrary to what people believe? Because we also discuss society and the representation, there's no ideal representation. Um, so your views would be really, really insightful for us. Very kind. Uh, again, I must say that these questions are far more intelligent than what we would have uh, uh, been able to figure in college. So thank you so much. Um, I think, yes, uh, <coughs> I think uh, in India at least, uh, I mean, since the uh, early 90s when Kimberly Crenshaw starts talking about intersectionality, I think there are ways in which Indians have uh, adopted and mutilated uh, what it means to have multiple axes of identities through which one experiences the world. <coughs> uh, you're right that uh, uh, there are ways in which there are not just gaps in culture, but in understanding, in memory, in history of folks who uh, experience uh, gender, sexuality through lenses that are not uppercast. Uh, and <coughs> I think it has taken a long time oh no. uh, for us to even figure that, uh, <coughs> that questions of sexuality need not be divorced from questions of caste, right? That th these are not two discrete movements that need to stand in solidarity with each other, that queer people can also be caste marginalized folks. But actually my um, uh, thrust is, uh, is, another, is a second order question, which is that Yes, one understands that uh, queerness and caste are connected to each other. I actually want to uh, then go another step and say, in many cases, actually, there is nothing more to queerness than caste, uh, right? I want to say that actually all of these things that you're doing, so if heteros are able to match with people of their own subcaste on Tinder, and queer folks are able to match with people of their own subcaste on Grindr, then actually there is not we are not seeing that much of a shift when it comes to queerness and uh, when it comes to caste and sexuality, right? So yes, uh, do people uh, experience the world through their multiple identities? Totally. But I also want to say that sometimes, especially in caste stratified societies that uh, dictate not just our professional behavior, but also our personal behavior, uh, sexuality might mean very little beyond caste. question. Yeah, uh, okay. Who is it for? Uh, Drubal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 
but uh, coincidentally the emergence of the idea of um exploring sexuality and exploring and gender studies coincidence coincided with the emergence of online journalism so you th see it is more uh, you know gender reporting and stories as uh, gender related stories as such are more common to online platforms like quint or news laundry than mainstream bro uh, newspapers and especially broadcasts so how do you see this emerging in the mainstream broadcast and uh, print media and as uh, upcoming journalists what do you suggest us how do we take care of the sensitivities of this particular topic while reporting on it in the mainstream print and broadcast yeah. apart uh, from online thank you uh, i mean that sounds like a question for akash sir but i will try to give like a little bit of a uh, um, the thing which is that Mm, I am not such a big fan of new media, I must say. Uh, on, or a, because, uh, uh, I mean, I'm like an old person uh, compared to like uh, zillennials. So, and secondly, I am not very certain that, uh, so actually when we were young, which was a long, long time ago, uh, which was also when we were in ACJ, there was a big hope actually uh, around the uh, kind of uh, early 2010s that uh, a, a bunch of new media organizations, websites, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, are going to be able to think about caste in the media in ways that legacy media had failed. Uh, and this hope actually was coincidental, uh, not coincidental, was uh, uh, came simultaneously with the hope that actually as a new generation of us, uh, millennials were growing up, we were going to be able to think of caste uh, in ways that uh, the previous generations had not been able to, right? Uh, but, in the, but in a similar way that in 2006, Khailanji shatters the myth that uh, a liberal, uh, whatever, a, a post-liberalization India is also a post-caste India, right? So then 2006 actually shows you that it takes a month for even the news of the honor killing to get out of the village. In that same way, uh, for us, Rohit Vemala's um, institutional killing was a, a, a moment where actually folks from our generation were like, actually, this heartbreak seems quite familiar, right? Um, and we have been at this moment before. So, for, so if, if there are people here who want to think about doing uh, work around gender sexuality professionally and more uh, in, in ways that are uh, enriching for themselves and therefore organizations, I would say that that space, thankfully, uh, now uh, there are enough upper caste queers. Uh, so, I mean, that space now exists everywhere. Um, so I don't agree uh, with uh, the characterization that uh, with, sp I'm, I'm not a, uh, I mean, I don't know too much about uh, other stuff, but the little I know about queerness and writing around queerness in India, um, and it's always better to uh, limit one's expertise because we all know what communities are experts on everything. Um, I think it's the sp uh, space to think about uh, queerness and journalism now exists in a broad spectrum of spaces. Um, the question therefore is, what kinds of stories of queer people do we want to tell, uh, right? And uh, what are those stories? So like uh, during their presentation, Rajesh was talking about when it comes to movies about Dalit people, what are the two, three kind of tropes that you use, right? So similarly with queerness, if one stories are either about uh, four people dancing under some rainbow, uh, and sometimes you have to make people dance, right? Because queer people get tired also, uh, right? And dancing is quite strenuous. If you know, Chennai Pride happens in June, so that's hot, like, you know, it's quite uh, like some peak summer. So if it's going to be between uh, pride and death, right? So either murder or dancing, then actually it's going to become really tedious, right? Because everyone dances and everyone dies. So it's not like a queer specific experience. Um, so, the, so the challenge now therefore is, how do you tell the stories of various kinds of queer people in ways that are not dehumanizing, right? Uh, and that's the challenge uh, that I think 
uh, the, the way to explore that, yes, exists more in newer organizations because they are also figuring out uh, their modes of storytelling and monetizing. But I don't think that that space has closed in legacy media. Any more questions for, uh, you know, uh, Brajranjan Mani, Professor Tirumal? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, this, is, this question is for uh, Brajranjan Mani. Uh, sir, you spoke about uh, the fact that uh, the economic, the model of economic development involving doles uh, or freebies is not working. Uh, and, uh, and also that uh, the, the schooling revolution uh, has not really reflected the kind of economic development that was supposed to happen through education. Uh, and this obviously is for, uh, is you under a, a caste lens. So if, if both of these things have not worked out for economic development and for more inclusive uh, policies involving education, uh, then what's next for, uh, for, for education then? Especially with the new education policy soon to come out. I spoke about prioritizing social development, our uh, mere economic uh, model of development. Uh, because uh, econ social development uh, is driven by uh, certain values, inclusive values for polity and economy, for political economy. And that will change things not the things that have been happening uh, for the uh, 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 for d decades after independence and until now. Uh, I think uh, what we need is a paradigm shift. Uh, the earlier attitude that uh, the majority of people and women uh, are not, quali uh, no, not qualified for education is totally unacceptable. Uh, it emanates, uh, a, as I implicitly implied, from the caste philosophy. What is caste philosophy at its heart? It says that different castes and different genders have different essentials. And because they have different essences, they deserve different treatments. So this should change actually. This has not changed in a democracy is a shame. And it was in this, this sense that Ambedkar said to the Constituent Assembly in a speech of his in 1946. Uh, it was sort of a warning which he elaborated brilliantly uh, in his speech uh, of November uh, 25, 1946. Uh, 49, when he was uh, uh, gifting the constitution to the nation, which is well known, that now we are entering into an era of contradictions. We will have one vote, one value, but in a society w widely divided uh, by all kinds of discriminations. Uh, so this has not changed. Uh, this should change and uh, the change will come from below, not above. And there has been struggles for it uh, since the beginning of the dominance. But you know, dominance always attracts uh, resistance and counter force, but it has not been able to subdue the dominant forces. And I think now things will uh, change because things can't get worse. Thank you. Kritika. Yeah, anyone? Who is the question for? Um, hello, my question is for Drugo Jyoti. Okay. Uh, so ca can we take questions for Professor Timural yes. and we can have a chat later with Drugo yeah. and Rajesh? Yeah, I have yeah. a question yeah. for Professor Timural. Yeah. 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 
So uh, the question is for Professor Thirumal. Uh, sir, you spoke uh, about the hypervisibility of upper caste in a lot of sectors, but the one space where we spe uh, see specially uh, in uh, invisibilization of uh, this section is when they are aggressors in caste-based violence, specifically in headlines. Do you think that also is a result of um, uh, the lack of analysis of the practices uh, of uh, Brahmanized uh, upper caste as well. Like there is more emphasis on uh, trying to understand the experience of uh, marginalized group of Dalit groups, but also from a very looking, peering into their window than a self analysis as well. Um, well, first of all, uh, sorry for being coerced into asking questions. <coughs> Uh, actually, um, I'm not interested in spectacular violence where somebody is physically hurt. I would be interested in how somebody is invisibilized in a classroom. And uh, that happens not because of a very conscious act of the teacher, upper caste teacher. That somehow is written in the body. There's a there's a way that body seems to be oriented. There's a certain intensity with which the body seems to be acting on the world. So I'm interested in that kind of a comportment where actually you're not aware that you are not seeing somebody or you're not attending to somebody. So that is the Brahmanic comportment which regulates social conduct and human warmth as it were. That's that's my, uh, I mean that, that's that that's where I come from. That's so. In some ways, I'm also trying to argue in a philosophical way that Brahmanic actions actually are much more elaborate than their intellectual apparatus. In fact, the what the intellectual apparatus is somewhat more simpler than their social practices. So I want to invert the argument that they think and therefore they are, they show resentment. No, they don't think, their bodies just grasp that. And the other person also gets to know of it. That's, uh, I mean, that's what I mean by embodied embodiment and uh, uh, Brahmanic comportment. I don't know if it answered your question, but that's it. Question? My question is to uh, Brother Ranjan Mani, sir. So, uh, so my question is, in the recent past, the stories covered by a uh, few Dalit-led online media outlets, like Mugnaik, for example, uh, received a wide acceptance from the people. So do you think that the increase in the coverage of caste atrocities by mainstream media is kind of, in fact, an outcome of the pressure created by such Dalit-led media outlets are not really out from the journalistic ethics or zeal. Uh, it's a combination of both. It's not, the, uh, not either or. Uh, of course, uh, the pressures from below uh, has forced uh, the mainstream media and uh, uh, digital media to uh, be a little more uh, sensitive about these issues. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it's an interaction taking place. And uh, I think it's uh, uh, essential for a, for, for a society uh, to have this kind of a dialogue, this kind of uh, social endomosis, uh, different uh, uh, groups of people, different communities uh, conversing on a topic which, uh, uh, which concerns only one particular community, but it impacts larger community as well. So I think uh, this is a very bright uh, 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 thing that is taking place, but this 
this is just the beginning. And I think uh, 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 new generation, new people are much more sensitive uh, to social issues than I had seen in my student days and the days after I did some odd jobs here and there in the media and NGOs, etc., and also in academia. So it, uh, uh, I think uh, some social endosmosis is taking place and uh, it's one of the brightest news of, of, of the uh, so, uh, society. Uh, it, 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 it's not just, you know, pressure from below or uh, primarily it's uh, uh, voices that suppressed voices uh, are now coming up. Uh, but also uh, there is a section among the traditionally privileged uh, people uh, who feel that things should change. And uh, uh, this is the uh, phenomenon which I, I, I think is uh, taking place. Much later, yeah. into a different uh, era of uh, the information revolution right. where the lag of the industrial revolution doesn't happen. Right. In fact, from the cinema onwards, right. we right. are simultaneously experiencing the information right. revolution right. in the East and the West, in the North and the South and so on. Therefore, and the emergence of social media and uh, digital culture, this whole uh, oratic, the, the, the aura has collapsed. And there is a commonality of social media and there is a questioning and the whole transparency and the enigma, all that, the enigma is busted in that sense. Is the, Brahm, is, is the Brahminic therefore still an elusive quality? Does it still enjoy that, uh, that, that, that character that you, that you, right. you know, that ineffable character that you, that you, right, that you were right, trying to talk right, about? Right. Or is it that it has now been, uh, is going through the rough and tumble of of, of being scrutinized, criticized, trolled, etc., whatever in, in social media. Yeah. And that is a process of miscegenation, if you like. Okay. That is, that is democratizing in some sense. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, Arjuna Padra has a very uh, interesting take on the question that you just asked. And um, one of the formulations of Arjuna Padra is, uh, in fact, it's, he also cites me somewhere, it's about the non-primacy of senses uh, when it comes to the Brahmins. 
what he calls the terror of the senses, the Brahmin's terror of the senses, he says. Uh, in, in, in some sense, the social media actually has not made sociality possible in the way that we think of. And in the whole essay, he is trying to argue that social media has nothing to do with social in that sense. What he means is, it has not increased social contact. It has not increased any kind of a human warmth. I mean, if, if the bodies are in some sense, uh, the interactive media, uh, it's an embodied media. No? The, uh, uh, the virtual technologies allow us to do so many things with the body now. But there is, there is a certain restraint in which it does. So in, in, uh, in a slightly different way, uh, he is trying to argue that uh, uh, the, uh, this, the technologies uh, uh, does not allow for certain kind of socialities. The Brahmin sociality has remained uh, roughly the same. I, I mean, that, that seems to be his question. I don't know if you've answered it, but the, the point is uh, there is a certain reluctance of, of the body to engage with technology, with there's a certain singularity of the body, the Brahmin body, which uh, he seems to be uh, suggesting, which has not changed with technology. There's a, so the, the, uh, the technology can allow for democratization, but the distance generating power of the body is such that it will not uh, completely, you know, uh, maybe it, it will do for in a formal, uh, you know, in a setting. I mean, you can sit with anybody and, uh, you, uh, you allow for a certain formal presence. So in my own work, I say uh, the Dalit students are inside the classroom, but that's only a formal presence. Uh, it's not a substantive presence because the, the Brahmanic sensorium won't allow a certain kind of sociality to happen uh, with upper caste teacher. There's a, there's a certain way that uh, the, they can only allow for a formal presence. They cannot allow for a substantive presence. I mean, that's my short take on that. Uh, can I add something to this? I would like uh, to add something to it. I think it's uh, so deep because superiority of Brahmin is di di uh, bi-dimensional. It's ritual, religious, as well as secular. And this becomes clear from uh, the very foundation of uh, caste ideology that we find in Purushukta. And uh, what is the uh, basis of it? The basis of it is that uh, there are gift, gifted people, actually they are godly people, and they, are, they come across as uh, 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 the readers of God's minds and moods. And it shows the, uh, you know, this uh, bi-dimensional, uh, thing. Uh, it, it was later uh, instituted in society, but its basic foundation was religious, spiritual, and that is still exists actually. And that's why caste system is also not going out. Despite all these things, I totally agree with the suggestions that it's not getting uh, uh, weaker actually. And today we see, uh, you know, the, the, the forces representing it, uh, are, uh, are ruling the roost and uh, actually uh, there are some resistance from the margins but Brahmanic forces had never been as powerful as they are today and there had I think in, in the last 200 years or so even during the days of freedom struggle we had seen uh, consolidation of upper castes uh, during those days, but, but in the world we live today, especially after the Mandal moment of 1990s, there has been a huge consolidation of upper castes against these kinds of things. And uh, this doesn't get reflected in our academic and media writings. And this is very problematic. And the very nature of Sangh Parivar or uh, its Hindu, uh, politics doesn't come out in the public. 
So uh, you, uh, uh, we uh, all read about the caste-based regional parties. Uh, you know, we know uh, who Lalu's people are and Mulayam's uh, party, Mayawati, etc. But what is the basic constitu constituency of BJP? Our media doesn't tell this. And all these things are related to actually the continuing uh, dominance of uh, uh, Brahmins and Brahminism because it's very deeply entrenched in our culture. In ways, actually, very few uh, uh, people were able to uh, understand. And I think uh, Ambedkar, Phule, and Periyar, after that, you won't find many thinkers, many writers who have been able to uh, bring it out. And that was just the beginning, actually, except Ambedkar's writing, who, who had uh, deep uh, uh, scholarly background. Periyar, uh, till today, there is not a single book, you know, which you can say a good academic tome on Periyar and uh, the movement he's led the ideas that animated his movement. And uh, about Phule, you know, uh, beyond Maharashtra, not much is known. And had uh, uh, Rosalind Henlon, uh, who did a pioneering work uh, on him and his movement, uh, which is actually, I think, one of the best intellectual biographies uh, in modern India, uh, we would not have known the kind of movement led. So uh, things are actually very problematic, but even uh, something being done is, of course, good. But there has been a struggle in history, and Kavir, for, for example, uh, he was actually trying to develop a counter-philosophy, a counter-metaphysics, a counter-politics, and he articulated it in so many words. He says uh, in one of his verses, Fehem uh, Age, Fehem Pache, Fehem Dahine Deri, Fehem Parjo Fehem Kare, So Fehem Emeri. Fehem is knowledge. And uh, it's, it's uh, Arabic, it means knowledge, and uh, it's Galat Fehmi and Khush Fehmi, uh, these words are related. He is talking about developing a a new metaphysics, a new philosophy, a new politics. But actually, as uh, uh, the, uh, the point uh, you, you made, uh, Rajesh, is uh, very significant that uh, there has only been beginnings for whatever reasons, the reasons uh, uh, can be grasped very easily if we think there is a huge educational, cultural gap between the people who are privileged, who are dominant, and the rest who are demoralized. There is a huge difference, and it's, it's basically educational. So if any change will come, it comes from massification of education, real quality education. And this is not happening, and all the, all the, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, strugglers, uh, and uh, activists uh, from the margin and uh, Dalit Bahujans, Adivasis, actually, I think, should focus on just one issue of massification of education. And if that takes place, India will change. Otherwise, it's very difficult. With, uh, you, you see, as, as I said, uh, you take a, in every uh, media academic institutions, it's almost an uh, upper class enclave. There are very few, and when you go to a TV studio or something like that, you are introduced, if uh, you are from a Dalit, Bahujan background, you have to wear a banner, you are a Dalit. Kancha has to say it every time. Uh, other Dalit guys have to say it. I will say to Rajdeep Sardesai, you first wear the banner of being a Brahmin. <laughs> Unless that is done, that is very, because it's humiliating, and we don't even see such humiliation, because he is speaking as a national representative, as, as, as a person who is casteless, and, and this guy is, you know, he will speak from 
this perspective and, and from these people. This is not national. And th this, is, this also came uh, uh, very strongly in um, uh, some of the points uh, you people raised. And I'm sorry for this uh, rather longer <laughs> speech. Uh, uh, thank you to all the speakers. Now with this, we, uh, I'll hand over to Hari. Thank you for all the questions and uh, thank you to all our guests and our moderator, Professor Akash Poem, sir. Now I request Anjana Krishnan, uh, Research Associate at Asian College of Journalism, to deliver a vote of thanks. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks for this colloquium on media and identities, caste, tribe, and gender in India. Uh, I think the discussions over the course of the day uh, were critical for two broad reasons for me. First, to understand the complex issues of caste, tribes, and gender and their intersections in contemporary discourses in academia and the media. But also more important because as media, we have to be self-critical and reflective uh, as practicing and future journalists or media professionals uh, to understand how these narratives are shaped by the media and represented within the media fraternity. Uh, I think these are very important issues for us at a time when identity politics is used to foment violence and unrest. Uh, for their valuable insights, I'd like to thank all the speakers in today's program. Um, Dr. James Ponnaya, Sunaina Arya, Dr. Shyam Kumar, Patricia Mukhim, Professor Tirumal, Brajranjan Mani, Dhrubu Jyoti, and Rajesh Rajamani. My sincere thanks to Mr. Sashi Kumar, Chairman of the Asian College of Journalism, for his support and vision in organizing this colloquium. My thanks also to my colleague, Akash Poyam, for putting together this program, and the Dean, Dr. Nalini Rajan, and Associate Dean, Professor Mohan Ramamurthy, for their support and participation. I'd also like to thank all the faculty members who have been preparing for this colloquium for the past several weeks. Uh, there are also many other important people who have been planning and executing this event. My thanks to the admin team, the registrar, Sudha Umapati, administrator, Malini, Bursak, Lakshmi, staff at the reception desk, account section, admin staff, the drivers and office assistants who have been handling the logistics of this event. My thanks also to the technical team, the system admin team, electric team electrical team, the library team, the canteen staff and caterers uh, for providing lunch and refreshments through the day. And of course, thanks to the support staff in the housekeeping, campus security, and hostel units for helping prepare for this event. Uh, finally, my thanks to all the students who have been covering today's colloquium as part of their academic requirements. Mm, I hope the sessions have been useful. I would also like to thank our guests, friends from the media and academia, students from other colleges, and well-wishers who have participated in today's program. I wish you all a good weekend. Thank you.